Welcome everyone. This is Michael Gibbs and welcome to day two of our free AWS Advanced Networking course where we're doing a free full AWS Advanced Networking program. For those of you that don't know me, and most of you do, my name is Michael Gibbs and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects. And we're an organization that's dedicated towards building high performance cloud computing careers. Now, I've been working in tech for now for well over 25 years, and I've been helping others get their first tech job or get promoted in tech for over two decades. And it's my absolute favorite thing in the entire world to do is to help people get hired. Now, let me give you a little bit of housekeeping in case you weren't here yesterday, especially while we're waiting for YouTube to try and tell everybody to come join our fun class. Today is day two of the AWS Advanced Networking course. Yesterday, we had a really great day. We talked a little bit about IP addressing. We talked a lot about BGP. We talked about the VPC. We talked about you know um, security groups, access control list. We talked about BP VPC peering. We talked about private link. We did a little bit of discussions of DNS as well as some discussions of load balancers yesterday. And we had a really great fun day on that. Then last night, we were gonna have my great friend and fantastic cloud architect and network architect and network engineer as well, Imran Takir, come in and he was gonna do some demos, but he didn't, so we did architecture training, which I love to do. Imran has agreed to come back on Wednesday this week. Um, tomorrow at 5 p.m. We are go Eastern Standard Time. We are going to do the VPC demo. We'll set up some VPC pairing. We'll do some, uh, so all kinds of VPC environments and, uh, and these things will be fantastic. So tomorrow we are going to do the uh, next uh, phase of the demo, which will be Thursday, because today is Wednesday. Um, my team is reminding us Wednesday. So if you just got here, if you can hit the like bell, if you tell others to join us, we are gonna have some fun networking parties. So before we begin, I'll tell you a little bit about more some housekeeping things. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we are gonna have our free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar where we'll come in, we'll tell you what hiring managers desire, we'll tell you how to get hired, how to get your first cloud architect job, the things that need to be on your resume, things that management cares about, how to take your past experience and show it to the hiring manager is valid. Really important stuff to get you cloud hired and it's completely free. We're gonna do it tomorrow from nine to 11. We'll present for an hour and then we will work with you and coach you for at least an hour. Coach you how to make your experience needed so you know exactly what you need to do. The registration link for tomorrow's free webinar is in the chat box. And Chris from my team just put it there. I strongly, strongly recommend you join us. And by the way, it is also in the description. So as we're ready to get started, if you can type hashtag cloud hired while we get prepared. So super excited to see you guys. Looks like I see a lot of you guys. I see some people that I know are in South Africa. I see some people that I know that are in Brazil. I see some people that I see in Canada, all over Canada. Uh, so you know, these are exciting to have so many people all over the all over the world. So let me know that you're here with the hashtag cloud hired and uh, it's kind of really great. So let's get started. Now today we're gonna talk about the communication, getting to the cloud. And before we do, I wanna make a correction on yesterday. Yesterday, at some point, we were describing cross-region load balancing, and I was saying we could use a load balancer. That is Azure that does the cross-region load balancing. When you're like me and you work on a million clouds, you know, occasionally, 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 you got to get something, correct something. So I wanted to correct it. The cross-region load balancing is, is with a load balancer is a special kind of cross-region load balancer with AWS. So let's go back to this. Drink your coffee, get cloud hired. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So let's begin. Let's talk about VPNs. Now we are today gonna to go into real deep territory when we talk about direct connections and VPNs. So we're gonna make it good. So let's have some fun here. First, we'll talk about what is a virtual private network. And this is really, really important. And actually, you know, while you're there, if you guys wanna list the countries that you're from, that would be kind of cool in the chat box. So. What is a virtual private network? And I want to define this because there's some very funny names for VPCs and virtual private networks. A virtual private network is quite simply when you create private connectivity amongst a public shared network. So 
private connectivity in a public environment. Now, over the years, we have worked with a lot of VPN technologies. I see Aqua in the group, and Aqua and I have probably worked with 30 different kinds of VPNs. So we work with IPSIG tunnels, which is our current VPN. We've worked with L2TP tunnels, another kind of VPN. We've worked with Aqua and I BGP VPNs, RFC 2547. We've worked with Frame Relay, which is a VTM, ATM, which is a VP, VPN, VPLS, which is a VPN. Point is, there, oh, there's a million and million and million one places that we can actually work with. Wow, looking at that group, Cape Town, Canada, Brazil, UK, Panama. Well, I've spent a lot of time in Panama. I loved it over there, Alex. Um, USA, Montreal, Poland, Bahrain. What a great place. I haven't been there in a while, but I had a really great trip there. London, New York, Manchester, which is where part of my family is from, Alex, the part that's not from Greece, hence the name Gibbs. Um, so fantastic, love seeing it. So the point is there's a lot of VPN technologies. Now, when we're talking about AWS and India, that's so wonderful. When we're talking about AWS, we're typically talking about how do we get to AWS, and we're talking about the internet. So when we're gonna talk about VPNs in the context of AWS, we're going to be talking about IPsec tunnels over the public internet, but I want you to know there's a lot of kinds of VPNs, a lot of them. And these other kind of cool VPNs that we work with, they're not all IPsec. They could be lots of different kinds of VPNs, so I just wanted you to understand that. But now we're talking about using IPsec VPNs. So why, why don't we, uh, why don't we just send our data over the internet? Well. The internet's just not secure. So if we've got private data, we can't send it over the internet. But why else? Why can't we just send our data over the internet? Let's look at the routing. Most organizations don't have these giant internet routers that can handle a quarter from three quarters of a million routes plus from every different internet service provider. So for that reason, we can't do it. Why else? What are the IP addresses that companies are using? RFC 1918 private addressing. Can we use RFC 1918 addressing over the public internet? No. So if we want to uh, tunnel our traffic over the internet, it has to be private because we can't push private IP addresses through the internet. So that's kind of the reasons we're really talking about this. So the private addressing being uh, as well as the... Uh, Security, that's the reason we're doing this. Guess what else? When it comes to routing, and we're getting into some complicated routing here, you've got two routers that need to form an adjacency. They have to be on the same subnet. Now, if it's OSPF, they've gotta be on the same subnet. Now, there is a way to do an eBGP multi-hop, but you still have to have network layer reachability, but as a rule, a VPN, both sides need to be on the same subnet. So again, private addressing. You can't have two people on different subnets talking to each other. So when we're dealing with VPN technology, what we're going to be dealing with is we're going to be dealing with IPsec. And the IPsec is going to basically, we'll talk a lot about the benefits of IPsec, which is a suite of protocols. But that's realistic going on. So routing peers need to be on the same subnet. We need the security. And we also have to deal with private addressing. If we use the internet, we've got to tunnel our traffic because of that. Those are the reasons we must tunnel our traffic. <laughs> So what's this whole VPN concept kind of look like? So let's look at it from this perspective over here. You can see what we're talking about is we've got our data centers. And what we do is we connect to the internet with our data center. And then we're gonna initiate an IPsec tunnel to the virtual gateway at AWS. So the point is, is you always need a VPN concentrator. You've got wherever your setup is and it has to connect to something. So they connect with AWS, they call it a VGW. Traditionally, this is called the VPN concentrator. It doesn't matter what we call it. You just have to terminate the VPN on something. So I wanted you to know what that is. And uh, for those of you guys that have career questions, we are thrilled to answer the career questions for you to make sure you get the right answers. We'll happily address those when the time comes. So if you've got career questions, you don't need to answer each other's. Um, we're happy to answer them for you. We focus exclusively careers on, on careers. We want to make sure you get cloud hired. So now let's talk about some IPsec VPNs. So IPsec 
is a protocol suite. It does a lot of things to get your traffic to its destination. What happens is IPsec creates a tunnel. And because your stuff is inside the tunnel, like if you've got the tunnel and you're sending your traffic through the tunnel, what's going on is you can use your private addressing. So IPsec provides some real benefits. For one thing, IPsec provides something called encryption. Encryption means that any of the thing inside of your tunnel is unreadable to the rest of the world. Unreadable to the rest of the world, which is really, really cool to me. So IPsec means your data is private. Nobody can use it unless they have the decryption key. But IPsec does more than that. It provides authentication of the peer. So if I'm, I'm just picking up names. So NitroPen, uh, I see NitroPen's name here. If I want to have a conversation with NitroPen, I want to know that NitroPen is who he says he is. I want to make sure that it's not Joe pretending to be NitroPen because maybe NitroPen and I are desiring to have a conversation. Now, because of that, I need to have that conversation with NitroPen, but I need to guarantee that NitroPen is who he says he is. So the first thing, in addition to encryption that's provided, is peer authentication. So this is really important, and this protects against a really dangerous kind of attack called the man-in-the-middle attack. So if on my left, oh, Chris, I'll call you Chris, NitroPen. So, so let's look at it this way, so Chris. So let's say I'm over here, and I have, want to have a conversation with Chris. This is Mike talking to Chris. We're discussing things that's great. But what if Jeff in the center pretends to be Chris? So me, Mike, talks to Jeff when I think I'm talking to Chris. Ooh, that's a problem. That's called a man-in-the-middle attack because I might be giving Jeff information that's destined to Chris. And that would be really, really, really bad. So IPsec provides peer authentication. Now, what else does IPsec do? IPsec does something else that's really, really cool. It makes sure the message hasn't been changed. Okay, so let's say I'm practicing medicine, something I used to do, and I want to write a prescription for two milligrams of morphine sulfate. That might be appropriate for a patient in the hospital with uh, chest pain. So I might write a prescription for two milligrams of IV morphine sulfate. What if somebody changed that two milligrams to 20 milligrams, somebody could stop breathing and die? So... IPsec provides message integrity. You send a check to someone for $100, you don't want them to change it to $100 million. You want it as $100. So IPsec provides encryption, peer authentication to protect against man in the middle attack, and message integrity to make sure nothing changed. Now, how does IPsec ensure message integrity? Quite simply, it runs a mathematical hash. So for those of you guys that are not used to hashing algorithms, here's what happens. You take something, let's say the word K-R-I-S, Chris, you run Chris through the hash, and you will always get the same output. And therefore, you know that K-R-I-S is the same, whether it's 128-bit or 256-character hash. That's what you know. It's called a hash. So, one-way hash. Now, that 256-character thing that actually equals Chris, I can't take those 256 characters, enter it into a computer, and get the words K-R-I-S. So the hash is one way. So you can show the hash without getting hacked. So the point is, is you can show the hash. So the hash makes sure nothing's changed. So that's what we're really talking about. So when we're talking about IPsec, we're talking about the following. Encryption, authentication of the far ends, making sure the meshes are integrity, and one last thing called non-repudiation. If I send, tell, send Chris a message, I can't tell Chris afterwards that I didn't send the message because there's a because it's checked. So because of this, you've got non-repudiation. It was kind of like the pre-blockchain prior to blockchain. The whole reason we're using blockchain or a distributed ledger is to show what happened and pr pr make sure that non-repudiation, provide that non-repudiation services. So we've got this. We've got authentication, message integrity, non-repudiation because we're tracking it, and encryption. So IPsec is really cool. So now let's talk about why, when we would use VPNs, why they're great, and then we'll, before this, we'll talk about their disadvantages. So let's have fun with this. While we're doing this, I'm looking through, and as I'm looking through, I'm seeing some more countries. I'm seeing Colombia. 
I'm seeing India, I'm seeing Jamaica, I'm seeing Rwanda. Wow, this is pretty impressive stuff. Love seeing uh, Kerala, which is the South in, in India. So really, really, really great stuff. Love seeing it. So thrilled and honored that you guys are here around the world. And we're all working together to get everybody cloud hired. Thrilled you're here. So let's talk about VPN advantages. Well, it's generally speaking, they're very cheap. Why are they cheap? It's much cheaper to connect to the internet than it is to buy a private connection between point A and B. So VPNs are typically cheap. Pakistan, awesome, wonderful. What else do we love? VPNs are fast to set up. What do I mean by fast? I want to buy a private line between two organizations. I call my phone company. I say, I want a private line. Wow, when we're done this, we'll utter the private line, you know? The phone company takes two to four weeks to set it up. Then I've got to get my routers and all these other locations. You know, we could be dealing with six weeks to set up a private line. VPNs I can set up in minutes. So with an internet connection, all I need to do is configure a VPN and it is done and it's done that fast. So what else can I do with a VPN? I can create point to multi-point or multiple tunnels. So I can connect to the internet and I can connect to an office in New York, London, Tokyo, and San Francisco, all through the same internet connections. So this is really cool to me. So this is why we kind of love some of these kind of things. And this is why we find VPNs great because they're so simple and they're so elegant. The internet is ubiquitous. It's there everywhere. So we can always set up an VPN. Wow, more Pakistan, Las Vegas, Chrislandia. This is wonderful. Keep coming. Tell your friends. We love having people from all over the world like this. It's just such an honor. So. Let's talk about some challenges with VPNs. Well, the internet has no guarantees. No guarantees whatsoever. So, because the internet has no guarantees, generally speaking, generally speaking, the performance is much less. So, internet performance is not consistent because there's no guarantees. So, you, if you have a 10 gig link to the internet, you may be getting 10 gigs one, one minute, you may be getting zero gigs the next minute. So there's no guaranteed throughput. Now, latency. Generally speaking, latency is, you know, well, latency is how long it takes for to go from point A to point B. Now, internet latency, because the internet routing can be anything, could be very bad. So the latency on a private line is much less than typically speaking than it would be on the internet. But it's not just the latency challenges. So if the latency from me to Perez the Deb in Las Vegas is three milliseconds always, it's totally, 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 and, and, and it's it's totally fine. Now, if it's three milliseconds to Perez the Dev, and then it's 30 milliseconds, and then it's three milliseconds, and then it's 100 milliseconds, and then it's two milliseconds, and then it's 500 milliseconds, that's where we get into problems. So when we're dealing with VPNs, in some cases, they're cheaper. In other cases, VPNs are a lot more expensive, especially with cloud computing, and we'll talk about that and when. A direct connection or a private line isn't necessarily more expensive. It could be a lot cheaper and because the cloud is different in the way things are charged. So we'll talk about these things and when. But understand that we're dealing with this. The latency or the variations of latency on the internet will be problematic and may not work for voice or video applications. So keep that in mind. Because... It might be one hop to get to your destination over a private line. It could be 20 hops or more to get to a destination on the internet. No guarantees. Internet traffic is considered best effort. So let's talk about AWS VPNs. When you set up a VPN to AWS, it's typically between your data center and the VPC. And that's what you're going to call a site-to-site -site VPN because it's one location to one location. Now, you could set up a multi-site VPN. Okay, my office in Palm Beach connected to the Tampa location, connected to a New York location, connected to a San Francisco location, separate IPsec tunnels over the same thing. So realistically speaking is you just have to set up both sides of the connection. That's it. Now, how do these things come up? Um, and then we'll, what we'll do is we'll do 20 minutes of, of lecture and then 10 minutes of questions. So we'll stop and answer some questions before we get to direct connections. So what ultimately happens when the tunnels come up, they do what's called an internet key exchange. And when they exchange their keys, what happens is they establish the algorithm type they're gonna use, the encryption type, 
And, you know, when you set up your VPN tunnels to the cloud, you've got an option for routing too. Two options, realistically speaking. Option one, you can manually enter your routes. They're called static routing on both sides. Option two, set up BGP. Let me tell you, you're going to be much better off setting up BGP and having all of the routing done dynamically for you if you know what you're doing, because that way you can learn what goes and comes and you can self heal. So typically speaking, you're much better off by using a dynamic routing book. Now, when we're dealing with AWS, then I'll show you some graphics of what this is going to look like. Their devices are highly available, their devices. So like yesterday, where we did some uh, architectural diagrams last night, and I said their devices are highly available, but that doesn't mean yours is. So when you set up a VPN, it already starts with high availability, which means you connect to the VGW and they automatically set up like a logical connection to, to two availability zones. So that's good. And when you set up these uh, connections to your two availability zones, you can choose to set them up as active, active, or passive. Now, if you don't know networking, active passive is the way to go because otherwise you're going to get out of order packets with active active. But if you know something about BGP and you've got some good networking people on your team, the best thing for you to do is to run active active and then optimize your traffic. But you must know what you're doing. You must know how to basically share one load, send one subnet over one link and another one and then create backup. If you don't know, it's going to be much, much, much easier to go one on and one off. So let's look about what this looks like. So this is your typical environment. You've got your data center, you've got your router, and you connect to the VGW. Now they automatically create these tunnels for you that go to the two availability zones. So it's high availability on their end. I'm gonna say this again, high availability on their end. But I want you to look at this corporate data center, that little orange device here. That's yours. So that orange device goes down. Your network goes down. The internet connection on that, on that orange device that's ours, our router goes down. Both of these tunnels go down. So this is not high availability. This is high availability at the AWS side, but not the data center side. So if you're going to have one, you need two. So the company data center should have two internet connections if they're going to use just VPNs. One would say maybe AT&T, one with maybe a Verizon or an NTT or a CenturyLink. Two different internet connections, two sets of VPN connections. That is how you get quality redundancy because just because the VGW on the AWS side is redundant doesn't mean your internet connection is and your router. So you can't just count on AWS redundancy you have to count on your own redundancy too. So just keep that in mind. Now, in this particular environment, you can see what we did here. We've got two tunnels and we wanted to block one tunnel. So look at what we did over here. On the top link, we sent the 172.16. And on the bottom link, we sent the 10.x address space. And we've made the metric of the 10 slash 8 good on the top and we've made the metric of the 10 slash 8 on the bottom 200 so we're basically picking a link that we want to use and we're picking a link that we don't want to use and by doing that we're choosing who we want to be active and who we want to be passive so you know i just want you to keep that in mind that you know there's that so now how do we load share across tunnels well lots of ways and we did some via BGP last night, and we can do some more. But the best way, the easiest way to actually do these things is to leak a specific route on one and a leak a more, uh, and not something else. So let's I'll, I'll, let me let me show you what I mean by that. So let's say we had I'm using direct connections here, but it doesn't matter whether it's direct connections or or VPN connections. So if you see what we did here on top link, and actually we. Uh, Well, let's just put it this way. On the, we, we apparently have a spelling or a typo error on what we've done here. But which, what we've actually done here is on the top link, 
what we actually did is we took the 172.16 dot, what should have been, actually, I'm not even going to use this. I, 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 I don't want to use this. I'm going to, I'm going to walk you back to the BGP documentation because we made it, we made it temporary. There's a little bit of an error here. So let me walk you through over here. So in this particular environment, let's, let's show you what we did. We've got two links. And what you can see is on the top link, we advertised a specific route to 172.16.0.0. And what you can see on the bottom link is we advertised a specific route to 172.0.0. And that way, 172.16 will always take the top link. And 172.17 will always take the bottom link. And then we added the summary link for backup. We talked about that last night um, in, in depth. And we also talked about it a lot yesterday. So... If that is, if you've got any questions that you need there, please go back to yesterday's um, discussion. And also last night, what we did in our discussion was as follows. We walked through a lot of these situations in there. So Chris from my team is going to put a link to last night. And Chris from my team is also going to put a link to yesterday because yesterday we did some BGP work. And when the, we did the BGP work, we showed you how to actually do this. So I want to make sure that you guys get that and you guys are aware of it. So before we uh, take a break and ask questions, let's talk about some multi-site VPNs. Yesterday, we talked about Cloud Hub a little bit. We're going to talk about it more times. There are times when an organization is going to have a lot of offices. Now, traditionally speaking, the way this would work is you'd have your data center and you'd have a WAN connection to your offices. And guess what? Worked perfectly. You've got a link. You connect to a New York office, a London office, a San Francisco office. You run OSPF on all your environments or your interior gateway protocol. And guess what happens? Everything works. Your routing is good because your routing is transitive. Now, let's be fair. When you're dealing with the cloud, you're dealing with non-transitive routing. And if you look at last night's whiteboarding session that Chris just put it here, I walked you through why AWS does non-transitive routing. They are protecting your organization from becoming a transit autonomous system for the entire internet and the entire world. So there's good reasons why AWS gives you non-transitive routing until you prove otherwise. But sometimes you need transitive routing. Transitive routing. And that's what we're realistically speaking and we're talking about. So when you need that, we're going to have to create transitive routing. And there's two ways to do it with AWS. One is Transit Gateway, one is Cloud Hub, and they operate a lot like a BGP route reflector. Again, we talked about this in depth last night, where basically, and I'll show you what it looks like, it allows the routers to use transitive type routing. So the AWS solution is going to be Cloud Hub. And what happens, and I'll walk you through what it's going to look like. Again, we covered this extensively. What will happen is each of these remote sites, they're going to connect to this virtual gateway using the Cloud Hub functionality. And Cloud Hub is going to enable transitive routing. And what is transitive routing? Again, in case you weren't here yesterday, when a route comes in from Boston, and it hits the AWS cloud, the route will be advertised to Washington and San Francisco because San Francisco and Washington know how to reach Boston because they have the route to it, they can reach it. If Boston's routes weren't given to Washington or San Francisco, then San Francisco or Washington couldn't reach it. So what happens is Boston will do EBGP pairing to here. Washington will do EBGP pairing to here. San Francisco will do eBGP pairing to here. And because it's exterior BGP instead of interior BGP, what will happen is the routes will be formed. So basically a point to multi-point VPN would be you take your cloud, you connect your cloud to via VPNs, and then you enable the cloud hub functionality. And then you've got hub and spoke routing just like you did in the data center. No different than it has been for the last couple of decades. So in the normal the data center, you order a private line or a VPN and you run your interior gateway protocol. When you're dealing with the cloud providers, you run an exterior gateway protocol, BGP. Why an exterior gateway protocol? When your own network, you own it all. But when you're connecting to the cloud provider, they're not part of your company. They are another company. 
Why do we use interior gateway protocols internally? Because they're designed to run fast and they're designed to work with us. But we use exterior gateway protocols to connect others because they're more tunable and they're more scalable. More tuning, more scaling, more security. So that's why we use different protocols for the different times. So when you set up your VPNs in AWS, it's pretty easy. Um, we'll demo that tomorrow night. Basically, you just determine the AWS virtual gateway you're going to connect to. Then you choose a, a routing method, static routes or dynamic routes. Then it's just configuring the tunnels. Now, the default way is, is, pretty, is, is pretty easy. Now, you can it pretty much, you know, you just get a configuration from AWS. It'll automatically can give you spit out the configuration that you can cut and paste into your router. But so realistically speaking, so that's kind of how that works. So, or you can configure it custom. So you take a network engineer or a network architect like me, we just designed the routing and switching the way we designed it to be and everything worked perfectly. So pretty much very easy to set up. Now, that's the way you do normal VPNs. Now, and that'll work. And it's perfect for your New York office, your London office, your San Francisco office. Typical remote access VPNs is great, but, 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 what if you need real VPNs? What if you need to customize it? What if you have 30,000 employees, 50,000 employees, then you're not using the AWS virtual gateway. Then you're gonna be looking for VPN concentrators just like businesses do. Where are you gonna get the VPN concentrators? The marketplace. So if you're on Azure, if you're on Google, if you're on AWS and you'd have to do any kind of complex VPNs, guess what you're going to do? You're going to go to the marketplace. Now, when you go to the marketplace, they're going to have lots of options. At the very low end, there's the open SSH VPNs. And I don't do SSH VPNs anymore. Um, we used them about 20 years ago. They weren't very secure. So we got out of doing SSH based VPNs, but you know, it's an option. Um, the alternatives are you go to a Palo Alto or a Cisco a Checkpoint or a Fortinet, they've got all kinds of things and they're what I would be using for my VPNs. And typically speaking, what I use all the time for client VPNs, except if it's connecting to the site, in which case, if it's simple, I'll just use the standard VPN gateway. But for remote access or complex things, you know, we're using something much more sophisticated. Uh, so let's go think about a remote access. You've got 100,000 employees, you're kind of working from home, you need a remote access VPN. That's where you're going to go to, uh, what do you call it? You're going to go to the marketplace and you're going to get this set up. So that's how these things work. Let me show you a graphic to represent the, the white, the remote access VPNs. And then it looks like there's a bunch of questions. I want to answer the questions and then we'll move on to the next section. So this is what a remote access VPN looks like. All of you are familiar with this. Basically, you've got your clients. They could be phones. They can be your computers. And basically speaking, you initiate on this far end an IPsec tunnel. And it connects to the VPN concentrator, which would normally be a hardware device. But because it's in the cloud, it's going to look like a software. It's going to be an EC2 instance. So let's go. It looks like there's some questions here. Chris, I want to make sure we address people's questions. So let's, uh, let's bring up the questions. Please inspect how to how to inspect traffic vertical at east west. Okay, so you know, class E758, this is where things are actually hilarious to me. So there was a new announcement from AWS that they allow east west routing, which is routing in between subnets. Now, granted, um, for the cloud, it's a massive advancement. For the rest of us that have been working in networking, east west routing or routing in between subnets is something that's been done since the 1980s. So, you know. East-West routing, how do you inspect your traffic? It depends what you need to do to inspect Class E758. You know, most of what you can you need, you're going to get directly out of NetFlow. Uh, or, or the flow logs can give you some of the information you need. You know, but I don't really know what you need in your applications. You can have applications that you can use in certain places to, to depending upon where it needs to be. At certain parts of your network, you could put a protocol analyzer or a sniffer if you have access to a span port. You could look at flow logs. You could have your applications kind of look at the traffic. There's a lot of ways you can inspect your traffic, whether it's going in and out or whether it's going in between subnets, whether it's going north, south, which means in and out of your VPC or just between subnets really isn't that, doesn't make that much of a difference. Now, having said that, 
you're going to have to look at the flow logs and, 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 and in an ideal world, you'll be able to do things. Now, you may have in between your subnets some network appliances that you could pop in there or virtualized appliances that would do that. For example, sometimes people actually firewall off parts of their organization from other parts of the organization for good reasons. That firewall will give you lots of ability to inspect traffic. So the key is what is it you're protecting from what? And that will help you figure out what's going on with the traffic because it's going to be your design that's going to determine what you need to look at. So if you gave me a specific use case, I could help you figure it out. But there's lots of opportunities to do that. And I've given you a few examples. Chris, do you want to bring in the next one? Are metrics similar to defining weights to a connection? Well, there's an algorithm. Prefer the path with the largest weight. Prefer the path with the largest local preference, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just the BGP attributes. Yesterday, I seen we covered BGP attributes and we covered the BGP protocol. Chris from my team put a link there. I recommend strongly watching that. Plus, we have lots of BGP training videos. And Chris, if you can put the link to our BGP blog, um, where we wrote a whole article about 20, 25 pages, made it really simple on uh, BGP, and we discuss each and every attribute. So, Chris, if you want to bring in the next question. Teller made media. Could I share why MD5 is important? Also, does VPN set metric have... Okay, so kind of two things. What, what is an MD5? So MD5 or Message Digest 5 is a super, super old thing that we were using, we use for route authentication. Have I designed networks that don't have any MD5? The answer is hundreds of them, if not thousands of them. So here's the key. As all MD5 does is it, it's a, it uses a hash to help two routers identify that they are who they say they are. So like when we talked about IPsec, and we talked about a key exchange and we talked about endpoint verification. The whole reason anybody would do an MD5 hash on both sides is specifically just to show that they know that the end is who they say they are and prevent a man in the middle attack. And uh, Chris, the second half of that question, you know, there's, uh, I'm, let's just skip over that and go to the next question because it's not, it's not clear enough to me. Um, Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Emma Muhammad, you're studying your bachelor's of computer engineering and have about three years experience as a working student IT support. Can I still start your cloud architect career as a fresher? You'll finish your bachelor's degree in 22. How should you prepare yourself for getting into the cloud architect field? Give you some suggestions. So ML Mahud, Ma, I, I couldn't re, I couldn't see the rest of your last name. It disappeared too fast. I'll get uh, Mahmoud. So ML Mahmoud, um, living in Germany. I'm going to give you some advice. The easiest thing would be to take our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Chris, can, that will pop the link in the description below or pop it in the chat box. And what we do is we actually train people to get Cloud Architects. Regardless of people's backbone, for people that have been working in tech, it typically takes me about 200 hours and about 16 weeks to get someone hired that have a tech background. For people that have zero background in tech, I still get them Cloud Architect jobs every day of the week but it does take me about 500 hours of training in this program, and it typically takes me about eight months regardless of the background. It's not hard to get somebody a good cloud architect job. The key is training them properly. I'm going to invite you tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning. We have our free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. It'll be 9 o'clock in the morning, so that'll make it 2 p.m. UK time, which will make it 3 p.m. Central European time, so it'll be a nice, easy time for you. We will tell you every step that you need to do along the way. I'm going to tell you this, getting these cloud architect jobs, I'm going to make it really clear. It's not just the tech. If all you do is study the tech, you won't get these jobs. That is a cloud engineer. A cloud architect is a leader, and you must study, in addition to the tech, how to design the tech, business acumen, communication skills, emotional intelligence, executive presence, sales skills and everywhere along the way so come tomorrow at 9 a.m i will tell you everything that you need to do to get hired every step along the way you'll be able to ask questions on zoom i will show you how your past experience is relatable to your new thing i will walk through your life experience which is probably more relatable than your time and support and i will show you how to use that to sell the hiring managers to get hired so no problem please join us tomorrow we can easily help you get hired 
We do it every day, no problem. Chris, you want to... Where does L2TP come into all of this? So L2TP is just another tunneling protocol. And it's quite common to use L2TP as a tunneling protocol and then use IPsec on top of it. So we're still dealing with IPsec tunnels. Nothing really is going to change there. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? That's it for now. Okay, Unless well. pops in in the next few seconds. Okay, well, if anybody has anything real quick, we're thrilled. Well, otherwise, we're going to go back to the content and we're going to start talking about direct connections, which are one of my favorite things to talk about because I don't believe in using VPNs when you've got high performance requirements. And I don't get to work on any projects where the customer doesn't have extreme performance requirements. So, okay, the question is where is the link for tomorrow? You only see November 22nd. Old time honey official. This is, uh, that's a good question. Chris from my team will pop a link to this. If it's hard to find, he'll pop it in the chat box. He's, he's oh. talking about the webinar. Oh. He, he, he's got an email. He'll, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if he registers for that, will we invite him to tomorrow's? Yes. Okay. So just register for the one for November 22nd, and we will send you an email tonight. The last question is from Pineapple Pyramid. Um, it, does, and he, he asked about our course. Does it matter which cloud? We teach all clouds in our course. Um, we teach the cloud. And when you know the cloud, all of our students know how to work on AWS, Azure, and Google because they've trained all of them under our training program. We teach the cloud. And that way, our students always know what to do. We teach how to design systems with the cloud. So I teach you what is a virtual machine and how to design systems with virtual machines. And if it comes from Google Compute Engine, Oracle Virtual Machine, Azure Virtual Machine, or an AWS EC2 instance, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. If you need object storage, it doesn't matter. So we teach you in depth about what these technologies are. And then after you know what the technologies are in depth, then you can work on anyone, anytime. So we teach you how to drive the proverbial car not how to drive a Honda and then say, wait, you need special training for a Mercedes. Wait, you need special training for the Toyota. We teach you how to drive the car. So we teach the design skills. What is the Cloud Pineapple Pyramid? It's a network and a data center that's been virtualized. So we teach you how to design it, how to take the things from the traditional network and data center and put it into the cloud, how to design across one cloud. Guess what? 3% of all cloud environments are only on a single cloud. The rest are on multi-clouds. A year ago, 29% were in a single cloud, and now it's only 3%. So we have to teach every cloud. We even teach the OpenStack cloud, and our students build clouds from scratch. I mean, literally speaking, every one of my students knows how to build AWS from scratch because they all do it. They all build an OpenStack cloud. So that's how we do it. Okay, if there are more questions, I will get to them later. My team is telling me that I need to go back and actually talk about direct connections to the cloud. but um, realistically speaking. And the last question, somebody asked if there is a payment plan. The way people access the payment plan is they go to our page and where it says 999, they click that white box and they can select three times, I think it's 350 or whatever is part of the coupon. That's how people access the payment plan. So let's talk about direct connections to the cloud. So first, what is a direct connection? A direct connection is nothing more than a private line meaning you call your internet service provider and you ask them to get you a private line. Now, this kind of works a little differently and there's some complexities here, which we'll talk about. So why would an organization use a direct connection? For the following reasons. Guaranteed bandwidth. Guaranteed bandwidth. Guaranteed latency. The highest reliability. And sometimes cost. Now, People would think that private lines are more expensive. And traditionally, a private line is more expensive than a VPN. But on the cloud, you not only pay to have the link, you pay a daily fee for the link, and then you pay a usage charge for the link. So it's not like your traditional private line. Because of that, if you use your links a lot with AWS, it is often much cheaper to have a direct connection than a VPN if you use the links a lot. So your traffic patterns determine your cost. So all of this, all this ROI modeling, all your financial analysis is based upon cost. 
VPNs are cheaper until you start using them. When you use them a lot, the direct connection may be cheaper. So why does an organization use a direct connection? They need guaranteed bandwidth, they need guaranteed latency, they need high reliability, and they also are gonna look at cost. It may be cheaper to use direct connection. It may be cheaper to use the VPN. It's about knowing which ones to use. Now, when you're connecting to the cloud, you now have three options on link speed. You've got one gig, you've got 10 gig, and you've got 100 gigs. And these are the way these kind of things are typically working. How does it work? You basically get your link and we'll tell you. Now, if any of you are familiar with port channel or ether channel or link aggregation groups, in these particular environments, what we're talking about is you can take, let's say, one link, two links, three links, and four links. You can bundle them all together to look like a big link, like the size of my forum, as opposed to little skinny links. That's called link aggregation. What happens when you're doing link aggregation, you're bundling the links together. So it's going to be bundled at layer two. So it's going to look like, if you bundle four 10 gig links together, it doesn't look like four separate 10 gig links that your router is going to see. It's going to look like one link. So ether channel or link aggregation group, this is realistically speaking what we're talking about. So let's talk about the key underlying technologies. So fiber optics, because this is basically speaking, it's kind of a WAN connection. So you're going to need a fiber optic. So when you're dealing with WAN connections, what do you've got? Typically speaking, with single mode fiber, you're going to have like a thousand base dash LX. With 10 gig, you're going to use 10 G base dash LR. These are typically your long fiber optic lasers that you're going to use. Now, if you're going to be talking about fiber optic connections, most of you guys that have been involved need to know that you're dealing with a send laser and a transmit laser. Send, receive, send, receive. So with fiber optics, you could lose the send laser, still have the receive later laser. And if that's up, your link doesn't will stay up, which means that if, if, if you can receive but not send, your link isn't really up. And what will happen is if you have a backup link, which could work, the backup link won't be initiated. And the reason the backup link will be initiated is as follows. It's the link isn't, isn't going to be perceived as dead from the router. So what we used to come up with was this concept of unilateral link detection or, or bilateral forwarding detection. And what would occur is if one of the, if the transmit laser or the receive laser would go down, the routers would have the intelligence to actually remove it from the rotation. So AWS supports what they call bi-directional forwarding detection. It basically removes the link if one link goes down. And that's pretty much enough. So. After that, you know, they're done. Now, when you send your VLAN, and I see some questions that are coming in, and I'm happy to answer them at the, next, at the next break, which will be approximately 20 minutes. When, when, when uh, you're sending your information to AWS, you're going to send them an 802.1Q tag. Last night, we walked very deeply. We did some architectural diagramming and charting out on it. We walked with a lot of 802.1Q tagging. If you have not, please see last night's lab section. Last night's lab section was architecture. Tomorrow's lab section will be hands-on configuration. Now, I'm going to show you logically what it looks like, and then we're going to show you what it really looks like. So on the surface, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to look like you have your, your data center over here, and you get a direct connect, and it takes you directly to your environment. And you know, from a logical perspective, uh, from a layer three perspective, that's what you're going to see. Now, it's not exactly that. It's not exactly that. So when it comes to this direct connections to the cloud, it's not really that single wire. They're hopped along the way. So what really happens is you buy a connection. And when you buy this connection, you buy a connection to the direct connection location. Now, the direct connection the direct connection location is what we in the networking industry call a point of presence. Now, what is a point of presence? A point of presence is a place where a lot of internet service providers are all in the same building. And I'll show you, and because they're all in the same building, all the internet service providers connect to each other. So I'll show you what this is going to look like. 
what it's really going to look like from a logical architecture perspective, I don't want to do that. Hold on, let me do it over here. What it's really going to look like is you're going to have your account and you're going to buy a WAN connection to the direct connection location, let's say over here. So basically you're buying a link to the direct connection facility, which is a building that's got a lot of internet service providers here. So you're buying a link from here to here where it's this little red device. That is the customer's router in the direct connection location. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this the exact opposite. Um, I'm looking, so the, on, on the right side of this diagram when I drew it, here's, the, here's where your customer is. So you're buying the connection to, uh, to the direct connection location, which is exactly as I described, and you're terminating the connection on your router. So you buy the connection to your direct connection location. Then you've got to get your router connected to the AWS router. So what you do is you get your connection to here, and then you fill out a form with AWS to get what's called a letter of authorization. And, and this is all part of the VPN side, or inside the direct connection process. You know, you go to your, your company, but what you're gonna have to do is you've gotta get this wire or cable between your device and theirs. So you apply for what's called a letter of authorization. And what happens, let's say I buy a link from Verizon to the direct connection location. I've gotta go from the link to my router that I bought from Verizon and plug that into the AWS switch. And I don't do that, the, the service provider does that. So I get a direct connect, what I do is I get a direct connection letter of authorization, which enables the service provider to do what's called the cross connect, which is basically just run a wire from my router to theirs. Then AWS uses their network and they backhaul your traffic into, into your systems. They use their backbone and they backhaul your traffic. So you buy the direct connection location to your device, you request that letter of authorization, which plugs it into their device, and that gets you back to their network. So let's talk a little bit more about this letter of authorization, because it's pretty important stuff. And while we talk about the letter of authorization, I've been informed by my team, I'm supposed to ask you guys to hit the like button and tell others. So if you're having a good time, if you can type, uh, if you can like and share and tell others to join our, our session. So you need a letter of authorization. So what you do, to you, the, the process is as follows. You go to the API, the management console, or the CLI, and you request a letter of authorization. And if your application is complete, what's gonna happen is AWS will provision the switch port at the direct connection location, where that cable, that cross connect is gonna be. So you fill out the form, you request it. When it gets approved, you download it and you give it to the service provider and they build your cross connect. It's just a wire plugging your switch to their switch. So it's super simple. So now we're going to talk about direct connect partners. Now, normally you just go to get a direct connection. One gig, 10 gig, 100 gig. What if you're dealing with a really tiny company that needs 50 megs, but not a full gig? What you could do is you can go to an AWS direct connect partner and basically they're going to connect you to the same environment but they're going to sell you a smaller, 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 smaller environment. And uh, the, what they'll do is they'll sell you a gig link. They'll rate limit your gig link at say 50 gigs and you won't be able to use more than 50 gigs. And then they'll sell you a subset of that gig. Now, when you pay for a direct connection partner, you're going to pay a higher price per gig than you actually would if you both had the full connection. But sometimes it's cheaper to pay 20% more for a fifth of what you need than it is to pay for five times more just to get a 20% cheaper price per element. So this is kind of the things that we're talking about. So a direct connection partner basically just enables you to uh, buy part of the link and they use a rate limiting, a committed access rate kind of policy on their switch. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, some actually we're going to talk about some interfaces, public and private interfaces and some of actually, you know, let's, let's, let's do that. Let's cover this first part before we go to questions. So when we're dealing with these connections, we've got both public and private interfaces. So what are they? A public interface. You connect to your direct connection location and it hits the public interface. It connects you to public services such as DynamoDB, SQS, and other AWS public endpoints. 
That's what you're going to get from the public virtual interfaces. So it works, of course, like routing via anything else. You exchange BGP routing information with AWS, and then you've got reachability of these locations. Now, here's the key. AWS does not re-advertise your route, so you're not going to become a transit organization for the rest of the world. Just remember, when you're dealing with these things, you've got a very limited BGP implementation. You can't send three quarters of a million routes, so you must, must, must be mindful and wise on your IP addressing scheme. Now, let's talk about the private virtual interfaces. Now, this is the interface that goes to your VPC. Now, if you'll recall yesterday, we spent a lot of time and we spent a lot of time and when we talked about BGP route summarization, we talked about route aggregation and superintending. And the reason is on the private interface, you have to use BGP, but AWS will only take 100 routes from you, which is nothing. Now, thinking about it this way, internet service routing is 800 thousand routes on average from an internet service provider. AWS will only take 100 from you. Look, look at it from AWS's perspective. 100 from you is amazing. Why? They have millions of customers. So millions of customers, hundreds of routes from 100 routes from each one is astronomical amount of routes that the routers have to handle. So they have to be smart about limiting you for the routing information based on their system. So they have to limit you as would Azure, as would Google, as would anybody. So because they have to limit you, you as an architect need to be really good in your IP addressing scheme. So you need to be able to summarize. So good IP addressing plan. So if you are not a CCIE and you have not designed IP addressing plans for big organizations, don't attempt to do the IP addressing of this. Find yourself a qualified network architect and it's gonna take someone with several years of network architecture experience to do the IP addressing design to make this work. This is not something that for the newbie, this is the most critical, critical part of the whole process. Somebody on LinkedIn made a post today that said, hey, it's easy to use. You should just use a subnet calculator. You don't need to know it. And my response is, if you use a subnet calculator and you don't learn it, there will be an outage every day of the week. So you got to know this. The addressing is some of the most critical component for all of this, all of this, all of this. Quick question I see from Abu. My students, I've got students in the US, the UK, Africa, India, Australia, and they're getting hired every day. Um, it has no, no, the country you're in doesn't matter, Abu. Um, lots of students in the UK. Um, so let's go to there. Now let's talk about the direct connection gateway real quick. When you connect to the direct connection gateway, you can actually connect to both the private services and the public services which enables you to use your direct connection to go to the public endpoints and the private endpoints. So what happens is they basically create logical connections for you, um, the same way we're talking about. So it, it's fairly easy. So let's look at what this actually could look like. So it would look like something like this. In this particular environment, you can see what we have. Let me try and shrink this so you can see more of it. Uh, nothing, things weren't necessarily designed to be streamed over OBS when we made these things, but we want to make sure we give you the best experience. So in this particular environment, look at what we've done. We've got our organization. We connect to the direct connection location, which is then cross-connected to the AWS environment. We can be connected to different VPCs, for example, in different regions. We could be connected to one location in a public and private. So we've got a lot of flexibility with what we can do here. Now let's talk about high availability. What can you do? Most customers, most, will be best with a direct connection backed up by a VPN. That's going to be the most cost-effective, guaranteed performance for the majority of this backup. Now remember, when you're connecting to the cloud, the cloud is now your data center. So, and if the data center is in the same campus as your users, you don't need direct connections because you're going to get awesome performance. It's connected on the LAN. But now if you've got a hospital, for example, and you're connected to the cloud over the internet, that might not be good enough because you need that guaranteed performance. If you've got a financial application, the VPN isn't good enough. So, 
you got to figure out what's needed. So for most customers, it's going to be a direct connection with a VPN backup. But I want you to really think about it. What if you need 40 gigs, four 10 gig links to get on the cloud? Four 10 gig links. You're not backing that up with a 10 gig VPN. So you got to make sure your connections make sense. So figure that out ahead of time long before you design it. Now, lots of people are going to be able to get away with this. Direct connection, VPN. Most customers, but not everybody. Not everybody will we be able to use this. So sometimes you need redundant correct connections. In fact, most of the organizations that I would use work with would need four direct connections in a link aggregation group with four direct connections in another link aggregation group as a backup and probably a hundred gig you know, VPN backup to that. So we're talking about a lot of different backups. So for, for the majority of the clients, they're gonna need a lot. So you have to figure out what backup is. Can they back up and literally run? Literally and literally run. So these are the kind of things that you're actually talking about, making sure your, your systems are right. For the person that asked, how is networking different than Cisco? It's not. It's not at all different. There are some slight idiosyncrasies in the way you do things in the cloud, but it's no different to what you've done in Cisco or what you would do on a Juniper router. And that's why network architects like me become cloud architects overnight. I think, because, they, uh, I think they were asking the difference between this and Cisco CCMP, like oh, the program, oh, the course. Oh, so, okay, so Lizzie, what I would say, if that's the case, I would say the AWS Advanced Networking is an intro to networking, and that's it. I would say the CCNA is a little more than the AWS Advanced Networking, and the CCNP is when you're usually starting to have networking people that truly understand networking, and the CCIE is typically where people really get networking. So what I would say is the CCNP is much deeper than the AWS Advanced Networking. Although I would say the AWS Advanced Networking, not the way we teach it, we would emphasize more on BGP, um, realistically speaking, because all of this is just networking. It's just on the cloud. What is the cloud? It's a network and a data center that's been virtualized. Why do people struggle to get jobs on the cloud? Because they don't have a network and a data center background. So without a network and a data center background, the cloud's foreign. With a network and a data center background, the cloud's normal because the cloud is just a network and a data center background. So we're covering more networking things, exactly. So let's go back over here and then we'll talk about the career questions at another time. I just, it was, a, 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 and we can, we can talk about the career questions tomorrow. And in fact, at the next break, we can talk about some as well. So. Um, this is typically, logically speaking, what it would look like. This is what I have to deal with pretty much every customer I deal with, a direct connection with a backup direct connection. That's my traditional customer, but it can be a direct connection with a VPN backup. This is what it really looks like when you're building a high availability system. Basically speaking, you're going to get a direct connection when this is a VPN, but it doesn't matter. Uh, um, but and that, that's what won't say direct connection location, but that's neither here nor there. Um, you've got a direct connection that would go to direct connection location. Personally speaking, I would generally run another direct connection to another direct connection location, or it could be a VPN. But this is what we're talking about. There's the technology in the term. One is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. And what do I mean by that? And what do all of us tactical people mean by that when we say that? We mean the following. If you have one, I promise you it's going to fail. If you have two, it may be enough. If you have three, you are probably safe. So one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. So multiple direct connections, you can load share, but that's really about tuning your BGP parameters. If you've got two direct connections and you don't block one, you are gonna get out of order packets. What'll happen is you'll, ha well, you'll have your traffic going out an AT&T link and coming back on a Verizon link or vice versa. So when you're dealing with equal cost links, you must do something about it. Maybe you push one subnet on one link and another subnet on another link. Maybe somebody sends you one community on one link and you match the community and raise the weight or raise the local preference. The point is you just don't leave your BGP routing to chance. 
you need to make sure that you know where your data is going outbound from and inbound. And that's all going to be done by changing the weight, the local preference, etc. So you can go to last night's course that we did. In the last night's video, we manipulated BGP policy. We changed weights, local preferences, multi-exit discriminators. We sent more specific routes, and I showed everybody how that would work, architecturally speaking. We also talked about it yesterday for about an hour. If you're not sure, please go back to that. The reason we built those fundamentals so strong is so it would be easier here. So just wanted to make sure that we talked about that. So link aggregation groups, kind of like an inverse multiplexing where, where you're just putting a bunch of things together. So basically speaking, you put a couple of links together into a logical single link. We used to have something called port channel. Then we had something called ether channel. And it is all, all, all the same thing. Just the name changed. So Chris, if you want to bring in some questions, we'll answer some questions. And yep, then we'll go back. A second. Sure, sure, sure. Mm, all right, here we go. Some of these you may have addressed since they came in. I'm not sure. Um, no, link bundling is not at all related to subnetting. Subnetting is basically taking a IP subnet or IP network and chopping it into little networks. When we're talking about link aggregation groups, we're basically saying I could have four fingers that are all separate and they're four little skinny fingers, or I can put them together into one big fat pipe. What we're doing is we're bundling so that it's obvious to the uh, to to the so it's not obvious to the routers. The routers don't know. So if we took four threads and weaved them together, that is what a link aggregation route looks like. It's only going to look like one rope when it's done as opposed to a single thread. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one, Caroline Macon. Is the direct connection location a data center? It Well, it's definitely a data center. It's more of like an internet point of presence where everybody just does their connections to each other. But anytime you stick routers and switches, into a building, it's considered a data center. If you put routers, switches, and servers in the data in a building, it's still a data center. So a direct connection location is definitely a data center, but it's more of like an internet exchange kind of environment. Um, but uh, now with the with what's going on with edge computing, they're, they're they're all data centers again anyway. So consider it to be a data center on a point of presence married together. Bobic Josie. Please explain the primary backup for a direct connection gateway other than a connecting across your regions. If you want to connect to the environment and you want to connect to your public and private environments, you're using a direct connection gateway. So, you know, connect to your regions, connect to multiple environments. That's the reasons we, we're doing these. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Toby B, a bit late, but could you elaborate on the difference of AWS making one path more preferred in a VPN setup to load shares? A bit late, can you elaborate on the difference of AWS? Okay, so AWS doesn't make one path more preferred. You make one path more preferred. You make one path more preferred by changing the weight to a subnet or the local preference for a certain number of subnets or changing the AS path. Or, or something to that, Toby. These are the places where you would actually do that. So you make it, AWS doesn't do it. So go back to yesterday's BGP. Um, it's We were about an hour into the session yesterday where we did BGP. Um, Chris from my team posted the link to that. Also last night we did architecture work and last night we can pop the link to that course again. We mapped out literally how you, how you, how you, how, how you can load share. So those are the places that I, I'd like you to do. We spent well over an hour on that because it's something that's not that simple. So Toby B, please look back at that. Chris from my team will pop the links to that while I'm answering the next question. Noel, so if using both a VPN and direct connection for fault tolerance, do you need to manipulate the traffic or would the direct connect be preferred? Generally speaking, the direct connection is preferred because it's a direct connection. Having said that, Noel, I don't do any environments where I don't have a policy, where I don't have a policy for everything along the way. I manually plan everything out. So I can know where my primary path will be, where my backup path will be. And I'm not just gonna have a primary path. I might have a couple of predefined primary and backup paths. So I'm gonna, 
I'm going to manipulate everything because I don't want to leave anything to chance. Although you don't necessarily have to go to that deep on this one, Noel. Tech with Mufaz, this is basically traditional networking. There are some limitations that are things that are different. This is grossly simplified networking compared to what we would do on routers or switches, but it's a very simplified version of networking that is just on the cloud. That's it. Chris, you can pop in the next one. Okay, so Blavik, Josie, you would definitely not be using your direct connection gateway to aggregate connections. You'd create a link aggregation group. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely not a not a direction we want to go down. So uh, Chris, if there's any others, would I recommend someone do with the CCMP do advanced networking? No, um, Liz CZ. So here's the thing. The advanced networking is good for you to do so you can learn the AWS versions of the CCMP thing. But on your resume, if we've got an AWS advanced networking on a scale of one to 10 that gives you three points and the CCMP that gives you seven points, I wouldn't do the things that give you three points. I would do the things that give you seven points. So Liz CZ, I, if I was a CCMP and I wanted to do something and I had a certified solution architect professional, which is kind of our minimum level of certification to work on the cloud to kind of be that cloud network architect thing. I would then spend more training in making sure that I had real rock solid BGP. I'd make sure that I rock solid MPLS, rock solid software defined networking. Then after that, I would put the rest of my focus on business acumen, emotional intelligence, sales skills, presentation skills, leadership skills, ROI modeling, the main skills that are needed for the architect. I would focus on the main things and not, not, not further certifications. I'm gonna make this real clear to you. The statistics on certifications are good. Getting an advanced certification can have up to $10,000 impact on the average person's career. Now Liz CZ, studying soft skills will have approximately a 33% impact on somebody's salary. For the average cloud architect, that's $50,000 a year. Studying emotional intelligence, statistically speaking, has about a $30,000 impact on somebody's salary. So if you're already a CCNP and we focus on advanced networking, maybe we can add $3,000 to your salary. If you focus on soft skills, emotional intelligence, you can add about $80,000 to your salary every year. Over the course of 30 years, training the leadership skills over the tech skills equates to about 2.4 million for the average person. So. Do I recommend with the CCNP doing the advanced networking? No, I recommend you spend the time with us. I recommend you learn the AWS versions to do the things that you already know how to do from Cisco and then focus on the bigger pictures. Those 50 hours that you could spend studying to pass an exam, spend those 50 hours on soft skills development, go raise your salary $50,000 a year, go get an architect job that you might never get, get move into an enterprise architect role and do something to live your best life. That would be my recommendation from a career perspective. Chris, you want to bring in the next question? Chris, both. You want to bring in the next one? Asim Hands, AWS has millions of customers. They must limit it to 100, 100 routes of customers. They won't be able to handle the routes otherwise. So there's no way they can deal with these routes. And that's why they limit it to 100 of customers. There's no router out there that could handle trillions and trillions of routes, so they have no choice. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? As seam hands, how would a direct connection partner limit the required speed? The way all networking does, you set up your router and you add a rate limiting policy. The rate limiting policy, whether it's committed access rate or whatever it's called on them, is how you do it. You set up a rate limiting policy. It's what we've done a seam in networking for about 40 years. We used to do it on frame relay links. We did it on every other link. And, we, and, and typically speaking, I even set up rate limiting policies on my users for security. Because what if a system gets infected with a worm? It can literally speaking fill up your entire thing. 
So rate limiting policy should be used everywhere as part of a security cohesiveness thing. So anybody involved in networking must know about rate limiting because it's absolutely questions. Which devices are used in the AWS cloud? Well, Varun, all these kind of things are going to be used. There are going to be some Cisco stuff. There's going to be some Juniper stuff. There's going to be some everybody stuff. Now, AWS generally has their own routers that they had created that were really big and powerful, as well as their own servers. But all of these people have stuff from F5, from Cisco, from Juniper, from Lenovo, from Dell, IBM. All the big players are there. Is it a good idea to move from Cisco DC networking to AWS cloud networking? I don't think you have a choice, Varun. I think all the networking is going to the cloud. And that's why all the CCIEs like me are all focused on cloud networking right now because we have no choice. The cloud is just a network, a data center. It's all virtualized. Chris, bring up one or two more. Chris, you want to bring up one or two more? James Wallington, should you get your cloud practitioner? Never. Skip that. Don't take that exam at all. Um, and uh, we tell everyone, James, to skip the cloud practitioner. There is no point to ever do that certification. Here's the thing. There are zero jobs for the cloud practitioner. I mean zero. Zero, zero, zero. Because there are zero jobs and it's going to take the average person two months of time to do the cloud practitioner and have zero possibility to do anything with it when they're done, we strongly advise you to skip this exam. We consider this exam to be not only a waste of your time, but a massive, massive mistake. And here's the reason why the average cloud architect earns $600 a day. Now a good one can easily earn double that or triple that, but an average cloud architect earns $600 a day. It takes the average person two months of wasted time to do the cloud practitioner which means $12,000 per month of lost earnings times two months is $24,000. So from a career perspective, from an opportunity cross perspective, we consider the cloud practitioner to cost the average user approximately $25,000 in terms of wasted time. So we like people to start directly with the AWS Solutions Architect Associate, go straight to the Certified Solution Architect Professional for our architects, skip every other exam inside of that, and then from there, we do other certifications from the industry, like the CCMP or Red Hat Certified Architect and things that are appropriate. So strongly, strongly, strongly recommend skipping these things. And regarding the AWS Cloud Security Special, strongly, strongly, strongly recommend skipping that as well. So we strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you get the Certified Solutions Architect Professional if you are a Cloud Architect and then you get something from industry. If you like security, a CISSP, a CH master, something that really means something to the industry. If you want to be a, a networking person, get a CCNP or a CCIE combined with the Certified Solution Architect Professional. Still take the training if you can get it cheaply for the advanced networking, advanced security, because that teaches you how to do the AWS things. But it's not gonna get you hired and, no, and all the employers know they're too simple to matter. That last question is about the DevOps engineer. If somebody desires to be a DevOps engineer, then getting that DevOps engineer professional is a good thing. If someone chooses to become a cloud architect, getting a DevOps engineer or getting a SysOps engineer will make it much harder for you to get hired as an architect, and it will have a very bad negative impact on your salary because an architect is a business leader, an executive that knows tech. These engineering roles are deep technical roles. The hardest thing that we have to do when we take engineers and make them transition into architects, we have to take them out of the engineering, deeply technical SysOps, DevOps brand and put them into the architect brand, this executive brand. And we talk, and if somebody has these certifications too many, we have to remove them from the resume to get them hired. So DevOps engineer, the DevOps professional is great if you want DevOps. But if you want to be a cloud architect, do not study SysOps, do not study DevOps. I know there's some certification providers that want to sell you courses. I want you to get hired. I don't care about selling courses. I want you to get cloud hired. So because of that, 
That's why we've made these recommendations. Okay, so let's go back to the content. I wish I could answer more questions, but I can't answer any more right now. So let's go back to the content. Tomorrow, we are having our How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar, and we will dedicate an hour to getting hired, and we will spend one hour, I mean one full hour, answering your questions, showing how your past experience kind of thing is all kinds of good. So let's go back and talk about DNS. Now, when we talk about DNS, I got to admit it again, we're going to get the propeller hat on. We're going to get a little geeky. I haven't gotten this geeky for a little while. I've been an architect now for a couple of decades. And the only time I get this geeky is when I'm teaching engineering things like I'm doing right now. And I kind of love my engineering things. I just don't do it all the time. So we're going to do it. In fact, I've had so much fun with some of these engineering things that I've asked some people on my team to create a cloud engineering program for the people that desire it because I don't get to be geeky too often. I'm an executive and have a company to run. I've got to get people hired every day. I speak to CEOs. I speak to hiring managers every day and I speak to recruiters every day. When I get to get technical like this, it's fun. So let's have some more fun. Let's get this propellers back on. Let's talk about DNS or mapping names to IP addresses. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Every device in the world that needs communication must have an IP address. So for people like my wife that she can rem remember 2.3.4.126, more power to her. For the rest of us humans, it's easy to remember gocloudcareers.com. It's easy to remember cisco.com or amazon.com. It's really hard to remember their IP address. So we've got this nice domain name system, which tells us B-I-N-G instead of its IP address. Love it. So that is what we're dealing with with the DNS system. You can connect to any system via SSH, via HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, or any protocol you want by its IP address. And you can, but you'd have to know its IP address. So if you don't know its IP address, you'd have to find it. How do we find it with the DNS system? Any of you right now, here's what I, well, I will do it in a minute. So the DNS system does simply this. It maps a name to an IP address. So, and then we're all gonna do a little mini lab. It's gonna take less than three seconds, but it's gonna be fun. So here's what I, let's take on this environment. We've got a user, they go to the browser, they type www.amazon.com. The computer sends a request to the DNS server. The DNS server says, here's the IP address to Amazon and the computer goes to the IP address. That's how it works. Okay, I wanna do it all, both of us right now. I want all of you, if you're on a Linux system or a Mac, open a terminal window, please. If you are on a Windows system, open up a command prompt. And I want you to, once you do this, I'll give you a second to open up a terminal window or a command prompt. And then in this window, here's what I want you to do. One word I want you to type, N-S-L-O-O-K-U-P, N-S lookup. Pick any website you desire, and then uh, I'll pick www.cisco.com. And what are you gonna see? The first thing you're gonna find is your DNS servers. My DNS servers are 8.8.8.8, which happens to be Google's DNS servers. And then you'll see a non you'll see a non-authoritative answer, and I will get the name of the AWS Content Delivery Network, which is gonna be an ugly looking name, e2867.ds. CA.akamai, whatever.net. Totally, totally, totally. That's what it's going to look like. And then we're going to find the IP addresses. So, all of you go to NS Lookup, look, type in the fully qualified domain name, www.yahoo.com, www.cisco.com, www.gocloudcareers.com. You'll find exactly what you want. And that's how you're going to deal with it. So, now you know how to, how, what where DNS is doing. It's mapping a name to an IP address. And in case you cheated and didn't open a terminal window, here's what it's going to look up, look like. You're going to go in there, you do an NS lookup, you put your IP addresses, note what you can see. You can see, you know, exactly where these locations are over here. So now you know that's how it works. So let's start talking about some more DNS policies. Let's talk about what goes into the name. So the domain name is broken down into three separate sections. And typically speaking, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about a host name, we're going to talk about a domain name, and a top-level domain. 
Now, when you pop these together, they become something that's called a fully qualified domain name. Host name, domain name, top level name. www.gocloudarchitects.com. Host name, www. Domain name, gocloudarchitects, top level domain.com, .org, .edu, .uk, .co. Because this is what goes into a domain name. And like I said, a fully qualified domain name is that. Now, you can also create what's called a subdomain. So instead of using www, I have a training.gocloudarchitects.com where my subdomain, the host name, is actually training. So the point is, is you can create a subdomain. Mail.google.com is a subdomain of Google. So just, just keep that in your mind. Now, when we're dealing with DNS hierarchy, what we're dealing with is the top level domain. At the top level domain, which is the most generic part of a domain name, what we're really contending with, what we're really dealing with is the .NET, the .CO, the .UK. Now, all of these top level domains, just keep it in mind, are gonna be controlled by ICANN or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. So these top level domains are gonna be the second highest level up second highest level up, directly underneath the root domain. Now the root domain is the overarching structure for DNS and all. And there's gonna be a lot of top level domains, for example, .com, .org, .co, .uk, .edu, even .aws. So what's gonna happen is you've got these top level domain servers. Top level domain servers, and these top level domain servers realistically speaking, are going to facilitate all of what's going on. And they're kind of kind of orchestrating and keep things in the So let's talk about what is a DNS zone. DNS is going to be broken into many different zones. These zones are managed separately in the DNS space by a bunch of different entities. What The reason this is done by managing different entities is it provides some very authoritative and granular control of the components of DNS. You've got a lot more flexibility and granularity. So, But I want you to understand, this doesn't mean that zones are geographically isolated per se. It just means that they're logically separated. So because it's hierarchical with the top level domain situated at the top, I'll show you what it's going to look like. So at the top, you've got your root domain. And underneath your root domain, you've got your top, well, your top domains, .com, .net, .uk. Then we've got our second level domains, and then we've got our subdomains, mail.google.com, what have you. So this is what we're talking about by saying DRS, DNS is hierarchical in nature. So while we're talking about DNS, there's this concept of the domain registry, which is realistically speaking, it's just a database that contains all the names and the associated information of your top level domains. Now, these organizations are not, that. For example, and there's people that manage certain top-level domains. For example, Verisign manages all the dot-coms. And what happens is all these organizations that manage these things fall under the umbrella of ICANN or the Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, when we talk about DNS, we're going to talk about registrars and registrants, and some of this stuff gets complicated, so let's just make it simple. A DNA registrar. When you go to Amazon or GoDaddy, and you want to register a domain name, you go to domain name registrar. They register your domain name. They handle the reservation of your domain names and your IP addresses. No, they don't maintain the domain or manage the domain. They just act as a vehicle for the domain. So kind of keep that under mind. The domain name registrar sells you the domain. Okay, so if I were to go to Google, or I'm saying to GoDaddy, for example, or AWS and say, I'd like to buy www.gocloudcareers.com, they're going to go sell it to me. And I become the domain name registrant. So I buy it from the registrar. I register by purchasing it from the registrar, www.gocloudcareers.com, and I am the registrant because I registered it. So, you know, these aren't my terms. These are the, the DNS terms. I just want you to all understand them. Now, when you're over here, let's look at this through. You can see you've got the domain registry. You've got the people we buy our domains from. 
And then we, these are us, the people that buy domains. See, now you know how that works. So when we're talking about DNS, we all we have to talk about DNS records. And what are DNS records? Realistically speaking, they're a set of instructions that's located in the DNS servers that are just going to provide the information about your routing domain, your DNS domains. And these records are going to be in a particular format. It's going to be known as DNS syntax. And when you've got the records, you're going to have something called the time to live. So when you see this TTLR t t time to live, this is how long your DNS server is going to hold the records before they get aged out. So here's the thing. If you've got a really long time to live, like 10 weeks, if you make a change to your DNS servers, nobody's going to know about it for 10 weeks. Now, having said that, your DNS servers aren't going to be very busy because they're not going to be updating very frequently. So with any of these things, when you're adjusting tuning, you know, do you need it to be current or do you need it to be stable? So these are going to be your architectural cons considerations, current versus stable. So please keep that in mind. TTL is usually measured in seconds. And there's a lot of types of DNS records which we're gonna talk about. We're gonna cover the ones that I need you to know for the exams and the ones that I need you to know for your careers. Remember, you can search these at any time. If you're enjoying yourself, if you could please hit that like button, subscribe and hit the bell to be informed of new things. We have a lot of cool stuff coming this week for you. Lots, 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 and you're not gonna to wanna to miss out on any of these notifications. So please hit that notification bell. Now, we're gonna talk about AWS's implementation of DNS. Now, mind you, we always start with the technology. We talked about BGP. We talked about private lines. We talked about VPNs long before we ever mentioned the name of an AWS anything. Now, why did we do this? Because I want you to be able to work anywhere. So everything that we just discussed is applicable on Azure and it's applicable on GCP. Now we're going to talk about some AWS specific implementation things. Realize 90% of this is going to be the same on every other cloud provider, 98%. Only the name will change. So we're going to be as generic as possible. So let's talk about Route 53. It's the AWS DNS implementation. Route 53 is highly available because it uses Anycast. Now, we'll talk about Anycast in a minute. Route 53 is very low latency, and it is also high availability. I've previously told you, and it's true, that every device on the internet needs a unique address. So I want to connect to Perez the dev, because I see his name, and Caroline over there, and Jeannie. Jeannie has a, her own unique address. If I call Jeannie, it's always the address. If I call Jeannie on the phone, it has to be her phone number. If somebody else had her same phone number, the other person's phone would ring. I need to know Jeannie's exam address and exactly Jeannie's address. And because of that, I'm going to do that. I need the same for Perez the Dev and the same for Caroline. I must know their address. So that is the way it works. Otherwise, I will not reliably be able to speak to Perez the Dev or Jeannie or Caroline. Now, let's do something different. Let's say now I said Perez the Dev, Caroline, and Jeannie, three amazing students of mine that I have incredible respect for. They're phenomenal cloud architects and great people. So let's just say for right now, they all had the same phone number, and I called them. I don't know whether Jeannie's going to pick up the phone, Caroline's going to pick up the phone, or Perez the Dev is going to pick up the phone. But if all three of them know exactly the same thing, and only one picks up the phone, do I really care who? No, because I'm going to get my directions. I've got the great cloud architect. Whether that great cloud architect is Perez, Caroline, or Jeannie, I trained them all. They're all awesome. I'm happy to have either. So when we're talking about something like this, that's what we're talking about, Anycast. So what is Anycast? Anycast is when you have your DNS servers, and they synchronize information with each other, and they all use externally a single IP address. So here I go to connect to my DNS server, and my DNS server is Google's DNS server, 8.8.8.8. So here's what happens. I connect to the internet, I do my NS lookup, and it connects me to the Google server. Now I connect to whatever is the closest 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8.
How is this figured out? I go to my internet service provider, and my internet service provider finds the route that's closest to the 8.8.8.8 slash 32 subnet. And that is where my DNS server is, and it routes me there. Now, if my closest DNS server were to go away, say, Prez, the dev, you go on vacation, you decide to go to, the, go to Greece for the next month, and your phone doesn't work over there, Caroline's phone and Jeannie's phone still going to answer. So Perez the dev is in Greece. He's having a really good time. He's eating gyros and souflaki. And he's in my village where everybody's really nice. So now he won't be answering my phone calls. But Caroline will be answering my phone calls. Now Caroline is having a great time. Jeannie is having a great time. Jeannie says, Mike, I'm going to Ethiopia for the next month. And her phone doesn't work. So now Caroline's answering my phone. And why does it work? I have a single phone number. It's an Anycast phone number. And that's what happens is Anycast basically takes all your DNS servers and they all use the same address. So you never know which one you're talking to in the end. So that's why it works. It's Anycast. Now, by comparison, if it was the if if I needed to talk to Jeannie and only Jeannie, I would call Jeannie via her phone number and it would work perfectly. She'd pick up the phone and I'd ask Jeannie a question. But Jeannie would be a single point of failure, but having Perez the Deb, Caroline, and Jeannie, three amazing cloud architects, all able to answer my phone call, that's Anycast. And that's how we promote availability. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. So when we're talking about DNS, we're also going to have to talk about DNS record. And when we're talking about DNS records, we're going to be talking about a lot of different kinds of records. Now, um, there's some that you should know. So let's talk about the kind that you should know. You don't need to know everyone, but some of them are really important. And I want to walk you through the ones you need to know for the exam, but also the ones you need to know for your career. All of you should know what is a DNS A record. A DNS A record is the most fundamental RAM record. It maps a name to an IP address. The I, the, a name to www.gocloudcareers.com. So that's exactly what we're talking to. So the next thing that we're really talking about is the AAAA record, which basically speaking is an A record, but with IPv6. So IPv6, um, AAA record, IPv4, A record. Simple name to map a name to an IP address. Now the next record that you're going to work with with DNS all the time is going to be a C name record. And it's basically a record that's going to map a domain to another domain, map A to B. So these are one of those kind of things that we're typically talking about, um, A to B. So these are those kind of things that we're exactly talking about. Um, Emmanuel, congratulations on passing the exam, and thank you so much for your kind words there. I'm thrilled that you passed it. The next kind of record that you need to know about is the NS record. Now the NS or the name server record identifies the DNS servers that are gonna be responsible for your zone. Now these are the authoritative name service, services that propagate to an organization's official DNS information. Now the next thing is an MX record. And an MX record is going to specify the mail servers that accept mail for your domain. This is going to be necessary to receive messages. The next thing that we're talking about is a start of an SOA or a start of authority record. And this is going to identify the primary name server responsible for the domain, the responsible party for the domain, and a timestamp that will change whenever you update your domain. Let's talk a little bit about more about Route 53. You know, it's, it tends to be relatively scalable. And it's really a, just the AWS way to give you services. So it works for IPv4 and it works for IPv6. Now, DNS uses the concept of a health check. So let's talk about what a health check is. A health check, whether it be a router, whether it be a load balancer or, or a DNS. We're going to go back to Perez, the dev, Caroline, and Jeannie. Perez, are you there? Perez, are you there? Perez, are you there? Jeannie, are you there? Jeannie, are you there? Jeannie, are you there? Caroline, are you there? Caroline, are you there? Caroline, are you there? I'm constantly saying, are you there? And you know what their job is? Perez is going to say, Mike, I'm here. Caroline's going to say, Mike, I'm here. And Jeannie's going to say, Mike, I'm here. So I'm going to go again. Perez, you there? And he's going to say, yes, I'm here. Jeannie, you there? Yes, I'm here. Caroline, are you here? Yes, I'm here. 
Then I'm going to keep asking ask this question. It's nonstop. Hey, Jeannie, are you there? No answer. Jeannie, are you there? No answer. Jeannie, are you there? No answer. I removed Jeannie from the people that I could call now or the websites that I could send my traffic to. When they respond, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I know they're healthy. If they don't respond, I'm here, and I hear no response, I think they're not there. I remove them from the rotation. So that's how DNS, that's how load balancers, that's how routing protocols, whether you call it a heartbeat, a keep alive in BGP, or a health check, that's what they do. And that's how these things promote high availability. If they're not there, you don't. When you ask them if they're there, they don't say I'm there. And that's the difference. That is the difference. So. Let's talk about that. So with regards to domain name registration, you can register a domain somewhere else and transfer it to Route 53. And uh, when you purchase a domain for Route, directly with Route 53, the service will automatically configure a hosted zone for your domain. So it's pretty easy if you just buy it from AWS. Now, one thing that I do like when you buy, you know, use AWS as, as your domain registrar, regist registrar is, when you do it, they actually give you domain privacy for no additional charge. And you know, if you don't have domain privacy, everybody's gonna know the name and the phone number of the person that bought the domain, and that's not necessarily the best thing. So getting it from AWS and getting that extra feature without paying for it is pretty nice. Um, so we, we kind of like this. It's a very good DNS implementation. Now, if you wanna transfer your domain, so you can transfer a domain from somebody else to AWS Route 53, but, Transferring domains isn't the simplest thing in the world. There's some idiosyncrasies. So there's some prerequisites that you need to know. So for the most part, you've, you either have to register the domain with a current registrar, or it has to have been you know, for at least 60 days ago. And if the registration for your name has expired with an old provider, first you'll have to restore it, and then you'll have to wait 60 days. And if your domain, and a lot of times when you buy a domain from a registrar, You'll find things like client transfer prohibited or pending delete or pending transfers or redemption period. If anything like this is going on, guess what? You won't be able to transfer your domain. So with Route 53, we've got the concept. Oh, so it's not, let's not even go there. So when we deal with routing policies, and this is where the fun begins. Now we're going to get into the cool stuff. We've got a couple of routing policies to choose from. We're going to talk about simple routing. We'll talk about weighted routing. We'll talk about latency-based routing, failover routing, geolocation routing, multi-value answer routing, and geo-proximity routing. And then we'll move on to some other topics. So let's talk about routing. Specifically speaking, the DNS components of simple routing. Maps a name to an IP address, real simple. What is www.gocloudcareers.com? Find the IP address, that's it. That is a simple routing policy. And you know what? A website with one server, basic stuff, it's all going to be simple routing. The next policy is going to be called weighted routing. Now, weighted routing is cool. What is weighted routing? I'll tell you right now. Weighted routing is going to be as follows. Let's say you wanted to send 90% of your traffic to one server and 10% to another server. That's where you would do weighted routing. Let's say 50% of your traffic is in AWS. 50% of your servers are in AWS, 50% are in Azure, pretty typical cloud computing environment. Weighted routing, send 50% to AWS, 50% to Azure. Hybrid cloud environment, Nutanix cloud sitting in the organization's data center, 50% to Nutanix cloud, 50% to Azure. These are the kind of things that we're doing. Weighted routing does that. Where else is weighted routing really cool? For you DevOps folks that are out there, or any of you software development people, you make a new version of your website. You want 10% of the people to see the new website, 90% of the people to stay on the old website. Basically, you actually, uh, so, so what you do is you set up a DNS policy. You send 10% to the new website, 90% to the current website. If the new website works and everybody loves it, you change the DNS policy and you ship everybody, shift everybody to the new website, not the old website. You decommission the other website and it's done. So these are reasons organizations would do it. They can test new software. So 
If you're going to do some type of blue-green deployment where you want to test a certain things in a subset, DNS might be a great way to do it. So keep that in mind. The next thing is latency-based routing. I love latency-based routing. Latency is how long it takes to get from point A to point B. If the latency is too long, it kills the user experience. So what is latency-based routing? I get on my little phone over here, and I'm on my phone, and I'm really having a good time, and I want to get some special treat for my cat named Cindy. I love my cat named Cindy. So I go to my phone, and I go to cindyscattreats.com, and my phone hits the Internet, and the Internet says, the fastest website is in Miami, Florida. Let's send Mike to the Miami, Florida fancy cat food website. These are kind of the things that we're talking about. This is what's going on with latency-based routing. Picks up your source IP address and sends you to the closest place. Pretty cool. Okay, now let's talk about failover routing. And when you would do it. Let's say you've got your data center and you're running everything in your data center perfectly in your data center. And we've set up a disaster recovery environment in the cloud where we want, if anything happens to the data center, we want to shift the traffic to the cloud and then let the cloud auto scale out to basically serve the needs of the clients. And we'll talk a lot about disaster recovery options. We'll have some fun with it. But when we do this, failover would say, detect the outage, move the traffic. So failover, again, is really another opportunity to do these things. So notice, what is DNS doing? It's enabling us to map a name to an IP address. It enables us to test a new website with weighted services. It enables us to find the user with the best performance with latency-based routing. It enables us to promote some failover and backups inside of our environments. This is really, really cool stuff. you got to love this. It's impressive stuff. So please, we, we love these things. So now let's talk about some more policies. Geolocation. Wow, this is really cool. Geolocation. I want you to truly understand the power of geolocation-based routing. Geolocation routing will pick you. It will identify your source IP address. And based upon a source IP address, it will act upon a policy. Let's say, for example, I go to my family home in Greece. Greece is in that Mediterranean region. Let's say I've got a company. And I own a company in Greece. I don't own a company in Greece, but let's just say I did for a second. Let's say my company in Greece services the Arabic world, the Israeli world, and the Greek world, and nobody else. I don't know why, but we just made a business that services Israel, all the Middle Eastern Arabic countries, and Greece, and no one else. Now, in Greece, we speak Greek. In the Middle East, people typically speak Arabic. And in Israel, people speak Arabic or Hebrew in most cases. So would it be really great if when I'm in Greece, I go to my website looking for cat parts or cat, or cat toys for my cat, Cindy, she's great. And when I go, I get a Greek website in Greek language and I know how to read it. By comparison, if I go to Dubai, while I'm in Dubai and I wanna buy cat toys, I go to my browser and my browser gives me an Arabic website. And because I'm an Arab living in an Arabic country, I can read it. And I got sent directly to that website, Arabic website from my source IP address. Maybe I logged on to the Atitsalat network in UAE. It sensed my Atitsalat IP address, and therefore it knew Arabic was the right country. And then a week later, I go visit Israel. And while I'm in Israel and I'm evaluating some IP, IT security appliances, I go to a website and it gives it to me in Hebrew. Now, in my case, the only thing that's going to work for me is the Greek website, because I don't speak these other languages, which is kind of sad, because, you know, I wish I spoke more languages. But the point is, and that's why we're talking about it, geolocation routing can not only get you to the server with the lowest latency, it can get your users to a website in the language of their choice based upon their geolocation. This is amazing. Geolocation-based routing, in my mind, is one of the coolest, greatest things ever. Send someone to a page in the language of their choice by identifying what their spoken language is based upon their source IP address, which identifies their geography. Cool stuff. Exciting stuff. These are the kind of things that I tend to love using. So, multi-value routing. This is this is one that I'm never going to use. Multi-value routing is like rolling some dice, catching them, flipping coins. It's just basically random. 
oh, send it to this server, send it to this server, send it to this server, send it to this server. I wouldn't do it. It's basically like simple routing, but with a health check. So, you know, I like to know where I'm going. I'd rather do a latency or a failover or something that I know. Automatic, automagic is the tech people like to call it. Random, I don't like random. I like to know exactly what I'm doing. I had an exceptionally good executive coach and she told me hope wasn't the management strategy and multi-value answer routing is hope. Eh, may go here, may go there, may go there. I don't do anything based on hope as a management truck. Now, the last one of these policies we're gonna talk about is geo proximity routing. Now, just know this, it's kind of an ugly one. It's a cool concept and it basically looks into geographic regions and the whole basis is send it to what's closer and I'll draw, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. And we took this picture directly from Amazon and you can see where we took it. Basically, it divides the world into geographic areas and you can shrink or expand these areas based upon a policy. And that's how it knows where to send your traffic. I've never used this for anything, um, but just understand that's what it is. One thing that I will say when we're dealing with some of these concepts is that, uh, when you're dealing with the Route 53, there's the concept of the revolver, resolver. And what happens is it's the equivalent of Route 53 for on-premises. So you can use Route 53 resolver in your hybrid environments to make sure that your, your data center can actually take care of what's going on in here. So I know I talked about health checks, but you know I love the concept of a health check. So let me show you one more time. Graphically speaking, here's what it's gonna look like. You've got uh, your environment saying, are you there? And the response is, I'm here. Are you there? I'm here. Are you there? I'm here. Are you there? No response. Are you there? No response. Are you there? No response. This guy goes away. He's no longer used. He's removed from the rotation. So those are the kind of things that we should talk about. At this point, you know, Chris, I'd like us to uh, um, answer some questions. And uh, perhaps around 3.15 would be a perfect kind of time to have that kind of conversation. So, Chris. Um, Chris, if you want to bring in some questions, I'm sure there's some questions at this point. So let's... Yeah, de definitely. Before we get to the questions, I'm going to point out the thing that you uh, mentioned earlier. So, Emmanuel looks like he passed the uh, AWS networking exam, from what I can gather. Congratulations, That's, Emmanuel. Uh... Whatever you passed today, we're very happy and proud of you. Congratulations. Yeah, and he's back for more. <laughs> Excellent. That's the key, Emmanuel. The key is never to stop. The key is to find what you like, become an expert on that one thing, become better than anybody else on that one thing, and run towards that goal. And what a great things will happen. So wonderful, Emmanuel. Yeah. All right. Here's the first question. Perez, what does it mean? Um, when you get four on authority, so there's always going to be an authoritative answer, which is the most accurate, and the non-authoritative, which are coming from the servers that are not using the most authoritative main server. That doesn't actually mean they're incorrect, Perez. Um, the sites will be using multiple IP addresses, realistically speaking. Um, but it's, it's really which server you're getting the information from, if I remember that correctly. I am not Mr. DNS, Perez, the dev. I'm actually more Mr. BGP and Mr. OSPF. Caroline Macon, why does the Cisco website have multiple IP address? All websites in today's world are going to have multiple IP addresses because you're going to have a different IP address to your website that would be in, say, your UK office than you would actually have here. And we're not going to just have a single website, Caroline. We're going to have multiple copies of the website and multiple availability zones, for example, or multiple data centers. Cisco may have one in their cloud. Cisco may have one on somebody else's cloud and they're gonna basically use DNS to go back and forth between and that's how they're creating redundancy. So when you need redundancy, you're gonna have multiple IP addresses. That's a great question there, Carolyn. Uh, Anycast is Anycast. Uh, Anycast is about making sure you've got multiple things using the same IP address. So whether it's rendezvous points and IP multicast, which is again, like a 30 year old technology, or whether we're actually dealing with just taking two things and giving them the same address, that is that. So 
It's not going to speed things up using NACAST by any stretch of the imagination. It's going to promote increased availability. So it's not the same. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. Now assume Anycast is making sure that all your DNS servers use the same IP address. Just like an IP multicast routing when you're dealing with a rendezvous point, if you tell both rendezvous points to be 2.2.2.2 and they would both answer to the same IP address, that is what Anycast is. Everything uses the same IP address. Okay, I almost wonder, and I have time to do it, if I should actually draw and whiteboard Anycast out. So let's look at some of those other questions and maybe I'll I'll wipe I'll whiteboard out the anycast for you guys because I think a lot of people are struggling with it. Resolve.conf. I am not a Linux admin, so I don't get involved into any configuration files. I'm an architect. So you'd have to ask a Linux admin for that. Noel, what is the difference between a C name and an alias record? They're very, very, very similar. A C name is more mapping a domain to a domain. An alias record kind of does something very similar. I haven't used alias records in years, but I've been using CNAME records, so I'm not 100% sure, but because uh, that's not exactly my back world. But for the most part, if you're going to map one domain to another domain, or for example, you're going to use a CNAME record in today's world. Do you have to, okay, so this question, Tech from Afaz, is a great question. Do you have multiple websites for geolocation? Yes, you're going to have to have multiple websites, which means multiple web servers and multiple load balancers. Absolutely. In order for the customer to be able to go to something, they're going to have to get in. DNS is going to have to recommend that recognize their location. DNS is going to have to have multiple entries to give the person. So a person in Somalia, for example, might get an Arabic page where someone that's in the, that's in the French-speaking part of Cameroon will get a French page where someone on the English side of Cameroon, for example, will get an English page. So it needs to, the DNS needs to be that sensitive and it needs to go to a specific page. How do you bunch your media files to get ready for an S3 bucket? Well, sorry, I just realized that that was not related to the content. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so what I would say is you can go, you can visit our AWS certified solution architect associate and professional training courses, which are completely free. And we spend a tremendous amount of time talking about S3, um, how you could get you know, files ready. Um, but getting files ready to send them to a bucket is no different than getting files ready to send them to any other folder on any other computer. Send them one by one, zip them up, it's up to you. So that's the uh, that's the last question. If, um, if you want to take the rest of the time to do a quick whiteboard. Yeah, let's do a little quick whiteboard. Okay, everyone. all right. Here's a question that uh, came in previously during all the certification talk that you did earlier. You got skipped twice earlier. So is it safe to say the network plus is less or more than the same? So Ken, I would say don't do the network plus um, at all. If you've done it, I would do the AWS advanced networking because it's going to look a little better. So the CompTIA certifications, Ken, are good certifications, but industry-wide, they don't hold a lot of value. And from a getting people hired perspective, it's really hard to work with these CompTIA certifications. So when it comes to it, I would say don't get any CompTIA certifications. I'd probably do the CCNA first and then the CCNP. And then if I really wanted to be motivated on networking, the CCIE. But I would say skip the network plus. In our experience with the recruiters we work with, it becomes really challenging for the A plus and the net plus. Typically, people at those two certifications do help desk where they work at like the Best Buy Geek Squad or, or, or those other types of environments with those certifications. The security plus, we find a lot of people that from that from uh, the, the take get relatively good US government security jobs with the security plus. And these A plus and net plus are typically very useful for the US government. But outside of the US government, they don't hold a lot of value in industry. That does not mean they're not great certifications. That does not mean they don't ask good competency things at all. It just means that the perception amongst employers is relatively low. So I would say CCNA first, CCNP second, CCIE third. And if you want to do a cloud networking one, this is a good one because this teaches you all the things on the AWS cloud. And what we're teaching you here for the AWS advanced networking 
will be completely applicable on Google or Azure. There's only a few things that are different. But when it's coming to getting hired, we need to build an expertise level portfolio. And that expertise portfolio is coming from something much stronger, like the CCNP. The Aviatrics Multi-Cloud Network Professional is pretty good too. The Network Engineer Professional, but it's still the CCMP Pro. When migrating to the cloud, no, you don't need to use Route 53, Caroline, because you could be using Azure's DNS and load balance between Azure's DNS, a data center, and AWS. It's just an option. Geoproximity routing is based upon bias of the AWS geographic regions. Um, you can actually look, we showed you where it was. I'll actually drop the link to the documentation and you can read it in there. Okay, maybe we should try to uh, whiteboard it out unless there's any other questions, Chris, that I'm missing. Difference between an interface endpoint and a gateway endpoint? Absolutely. Sharif, we covered that very extensively yesterday, so please go back and see yesterday's. But gateway endpoints are used to connect to uh, S3 for the most part. Interface endpoints, base, and they work via routing. Interface endpoints are used to connect to other AWS and external services, and they work via the private link service. Interface endpoints, which use private link, basically create an elastic network interface, stick it on both sides of the environment, and they also do not. So gateway endpoints connect to S3. Interface endpoints, for the most part, connect to other stuff, almost everything else. Other VPCs and other public AWS services, for the most part. I'm simplifying it a little bit because of time, but if you go back to yesterday, we discussed them for about an hour, hour and a half, the different types of endpoints. So, so let's do this. Let's let's do a little mini whiteboard session and try and work on Anycast. Because I really want you guys to get this. And there was a lot of questions on Anycast, so let's make sure we do it. And M. Mahmoud, I would not do an AWS security certification. If I wanted a security certification, I would do a CISSP. I would do a CCSP. I would do a CEH master or I would do the offensive security professional. Note what I'm describing here. Big, 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 heavy hitting industry certifications. They matter a million times more than these cloud certifications when it comes to getting hired. Here's the reason why they are much, the cloud certifications are by far the easiest of all of them. So let's go map this one out. There's also another reason the other reason these other bigger industry certifications are gonna mean more for the cloud are the following reasons. These cloud certifications have a reputation of teaching the name of the service and how to configure the service without teaching anything related to the content. These networking certifications or security certifications are typically taught by people that actually have worked in the field. So they're not like somebody with a webcam making, uh, uh, making content. So let's just make sure that the reason we keep talking about these big certifications is I wanna get you guys hired. So. Let's go do let's go do some of this Anycast stuff. So let me, let me try and uh, let's get this set up so we can see. So let's let's whiteboard this out. So in this particular environment where we're at, let's draw it. So let's say we've got you the user over here. Uh, user. Now over here we've got this network. Call it the internet. We'll call this the internet. It would be helpful if I use a different color text than I'm actually using to write it. So let's do this. Okay, color. So here we've got the internet. What Anycast is, is we're going to have here, we're going to use Google's DNS servers names just because I think it's an easy name to remember. They use 8.8.8.8. So this is Anycast. And over here, we're going to have the website. So here we've got the user. The user goes to www.gocloudcareers.com. The user hits the internet and they find the DNS server. 
move this over here. Right now, the closest DNS server to me is over here. So I go to my internet service provider. My internet service provider routes me to 8.8.8. And 8.8.8 says, hey, guess what, Mike? To go to GoCloud Careers, here's your IP address. So it returns the information. And I go from my user, I go right over here, and I connect to the website. And all's good. That's how it works. Now, something happens to this server. It dies. Servers fall apart all the time. I now need to make another request. And this time that we're going to go to cindythecat.com. I've got a really neat cat. Her name Cindy. So now I want to go to cindythecat.com. So here I do. I go to my browser. I type www.cindythecat.com. I don't know if that's a real domain or not. I just tried it. So I now go to the nearest server and it says to get to Cindy the Cat, go here. So I start my connection. Now I connect to Cindy the Cat. Now this one dies because servers die. It happens all the time. Now I want to go to the internet and I reach out there and I now instead of Cindy the Cat, I want to go to Cindy the Cat's friends. I probably spelled it wrong. F -R -I -N, friends com. So now I want to go to the Cindy the Cat's friends. And this is my cat Cindy's squirrels and lizards and frogs that she likes to chase. This is her cat. This is a website that she made. And she wants me to see all the frogs that she eats and lizards that she eats each day. And heaven forbid the, the mice and the rabbits and the birds that she brings me. So now I go to this website and wow, guess what just happened? This DNS server responded. So now I connect to here. Now this one goes away. And now I connect to this DNS server and still reach the site. Now here's the key. The reason why this works is all I'm doing is I'm asking a question. So it doesn't matter to me which 8.8.8 .8 I actually went to. Now if I needed to have a real conversation and transfer data for real between me and 8.8.8, .8 it would need to be unique. But it doesn't need to be unique because what's going to happen is I'm going to go. And if there's these two devices, I'm going to reach the ones that's closest. So if I go here and it's here, great. If this doesn't isn't here, guess what? I'm still going to reach the other one. It doesn't matter. I want to make sure that, that is clear because as any cast, there were a lot of, lot of questions on it. A lot of questions on there. So I want to make sure that everybody understood those before we move forward. Did everybody understand that? If you understood that anycast, put hashtag anycast in the window. While and Cloud we're Learner. That, while we're waiting on that response, I got a couple of questions to pop in before we get back to the content. <laughs> Sounds good. And Cloud Learner, you definitely don't want to be one of Cindy's little friends. My cat Cindy is the sweetest and cutest thing, but she doesn't have any maternal instincts whatsoever. She is, however, like the king of the jungle or the queen of the jungle, I should say. She catches everything. Yeah, so so we'll do these last two questions and then get back to the content. Sounds good. Tyrone, so AWS clients get 100, 100 routes that they can use. So it means we can send them 100 routes or 100 subnets, which is uh, not a lot, but, I mean, it's an incredibly small number. I deal with organizations with 30, 40,000 subnets, not 100 subnets. But, Tyrone, we got to remember, what is AWS trying to achieve? What are the limitations on AWS and how many customers they have? 100 routes from as many customers as they have is still pretty darn impressive. So, and then Chris, you can bring in the next one. Yeah, so it's two, uh, technically it's two questions, but they're around the same thing, so. What is the prerequisite? Okay, so what is the prerequisite of CISSP certifications? Typically speaking, they say five years. So you've got to find five years of some kind of security that you've done in the past. Um, look carefully at the security you've done. A lot of people have done security and haven't realized it. So it definitely is there. I personally, it depends on the career that I'm looking for, Marla. For my architects, I like the CISSP or the CCSP because these are more architectural. They're more about how to design. I like the CEH master, which is the CEH plus the practical. And I like the offensive security professional. I like these more for my cloud engineers, my cloud security engineers. But I also like the CEH master and the offensive security professional when I've got someone with no experience. 
Here's the reason I like these Marla, these deep technical ones, like the CH Master, include a paper exam. And don't get me, the paper exam is about a million times harder than an AWS exam, but that's not the reason I like it. I like it because you actually have to do a lab exam after the fact. So after interviewing a thousand people that were AWS certified and finding about 999 people that couldn't actually do the job, a couple of things became clear. One is there are so many exam dumps for these AWS exams that there are 99% of the people that have passed the exams don't know any of the material. And that has a massive impact on the value of the certification. Again, it is not that AWS didn't do a great job. AWS is amazing. It's that if you everybody can get a cheat copy of the exam and they can pass the exam and know nothing, then the certifications don't hold as much value. Now, the courses that are out there are doing that because they're teaching the name of the service and how to configure it, which is fine for an implementation engineer, but the rest of us that have to design systems, it's not really relevant to us. So CISSP is my preferred. CCSP is my second. For my cloud security engineers, not architects, I love that CEH master. I love the offensive security professional. Um, and those are the things. So that's why I get to get really creative. It's about building the expert portfolio. And whether I need, if I've got a deeply technical person, I do a CISSP. If I've got somebody that's not technical enough and has no tech background, a lot of times I like to get them like a CEH master if they've got very limited tech background because that's going to show deeper tech than the CISSP, which is more architecture. So it's about managing and mapping the certification with the career. It's not a random thing. It's getting it perfect. Okay, were there any more? If not, I will get to some load balancers before the end of the day. Yes, there were more. But a second. So the last one, CISSP or CCSP. I prefer the CISSP first. I like things that are less cloud-centric for the cloud. And here's the reason why. The cloud is just a virtualized network and a data center. So what do we do? We take the stuff from the data center and move it to the cloud. So if you've got the traditional one, it works in the cloud and out of the cloud, which is the reality of our lives, multiple clouds. But if you just do the cloud one, it's often not enough for the reality of our lives, which is half data center or half cloud. And that's why we do this. Okay, so let's get back to the content. Let's talk about load balancers. And, you know, like anything else, when we talk about load balancers, first, we're going to talk about what is the technology. Then we will talk about how the technology works. I'm going to do this because I want you to be able to work on Nutanix, on OpenStack, on AWS, Azure, Google, Oracle, Dell, Palo Alto, or the Cisco cloud, or any of the other million clouds that are out there, because that's what a cloud architect is. So let's talk about load balancers. A load balancer, what is it? It's a device that improves performance and availability. That's why organizations use load balancers, to improve performance and availability. If there was no, no need to do that, we wouldn't use load balancers. Load balancers help with scalability and performance and availability by the following ways. They enable us to use multiple servers. So without a load balancer, all we can do is find the biggest server we can. With a load balancer, we can use a lot of servers and load share between them. So which is stronger? One thing that can lift 1,000 pounds, one person that can lift 1,000 pounds, or 20 friends that can lift 500 pounds each? One gives you 10,000 pounds, the super strong man gives you 1,000 pounds. So parallel computing of multiple computers doing things side by side, it's not exactly parallel computing, it's something different, but, it, but the concept of bundle your systems together. Put 10 servers together and one server fails, you still have nine. Use one giant server and it fails, you've got nothing. So load balancers, improve performance and availability, eliminating single points of failure. Now, when we talk about load balancers, there's really two kinds. And when we talk about AWS, they've got all kinds of fancy names, but there's only two kinds. There are network load balancers and there are application load balancers, regardless of the names. A network load balancer operates at layer four. It is not that smart. It looks at the TCP UDP header. 
source destination protocol and port. It's it. Layer four. Fast. Stuff comes into the load balancer and it's out. It's kind of like me adding 2 plus 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. It's fast. I'm not doing anything. Now an application load balancer operates at layer 7. Layer 7 of the model. Layer 7 is the following. The application layer, we talked about it in depth yesterday. At the application layer, these layer 7 load balancers are really smart. They can look at paths in the header. So remember this when you're looking in the header and you're doing complex things, it's going to be slower. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Easy math. Now do that with calculus in your head. You're not doing it. You're going to be able to do it, but it's going to be slow. So network load balancers fast. Application load balancers slow. How do you determine what kind of load balancer you use? Do you need performance? You use a network load balancer. Do you need intelligence? Use an application load balancer. Sometimes you'll combine them together. And if you guys want to talk about advanced load balancer design, and we'll talk about load balancer sandwiches and fancy load balancer design, we'll talk about it. But understand, regardless of the names, regardless of what all the creative marketing people thought of, and all these fancy names, network load balancer, application load balancer, that's all it is. Nothing beyond that. Those are our two kinds of load balancers that we're talking about. And when we deal with AWS, sure, they'll come up with an elastic load balancer for the network, an elastic load balancer for an application. And then they'll talk about a classic load balancer for which you can choose an application load balancer again, or a network load balancer. Or what did we used to use for a million and one years to load balance firewalls? We use network load balancers. So of course, AWS is a branded network load balancer that they call a gateway load balancer that's used to load balance between network devices. Nothing new, same. Network load balancer, application load balancer. We just have a bunch of names for things. When we know what they are, and we truly know what they are, and we know exactly what they are, it's the same on AWS, Azure, Google, Oracle, OpenStack, all the same. I want you guys to be cloud architects. I want you to know what the tech is. I don't want you to be a junior tech that just done with the name of a service. I want you to be capable, employable, and have fantastic careers. And that's why we're building it this way. So now learn it. What is now with AWS, their marketing people like to stick the word elastic in front of everything. So with AWS, we call a load balancer an elastic load balancer. Understand, still network or application, you need to pick one. AWS load balancers are auto scaling, meaning they add capacity as needed. Guess what? They're a load balancer, they mean an IP address. So if auto scaling occurs, you're gonna need an address. So remember what I told you yesterday. WAN links slash 30, LAN links, the smallest you should use is a slash 24. Don't use a slash 28 because it's the smallest, use a slash 24, good guideline. If you run out of IP addresses, auto scaling stops. The smallest subnet you should use for a LAN is a slash 24, the biggest you should use is a slash 23. Most point to point WAN links are slash 30s. IP addressing in 10 seconds from, from a 25 year network architect. There's a lot more that goes into it, but kind of keep those, in, those subnet sizes in your mind. So when you're dealing with these things, realize that load balancers can load balance across availability zones. Realize they use health checks, just like DNS, and the elastic load balancers can terminate SSL connections, meaning they don't have to go to the server. So let's talk about the elastic load balancers for the network. Very, very fast. Millions of requests per second. Traffic. Patterns that change, they're phenomenal. Now, with the AWS Elastic Load Balancers, the connections are stateful. Here's what it means. If something goes to the load balancer and hits server A, the whole session will be on server A. The next session goes on server B, and the whole session will be on server B. The next session goes on server C, and the next session will be on server C. Poof, everything works awesome. Server A, server B, server C, it's stateful. It doesn't lose it. How does this occur? The way the load balancer looks at the flow, it creates what's called a sticky session and it keeps it permanent. So network load balancers are really, really good. Now, with network load balancers, you can put a static IP address for the load balancer. Now, until a few weeks ago, you couldn't do that on an application load balancer with AWS. But now you can, thankfully. Network load balancers also enable you to run into a container. So 
What's it going to look like? Got a network load balancer over here. Load balance between uh, two availability zones like we're doing over here. You could have used a load balance or the load balance in between servers. This is realistically speaking what we're talking about. It's relatively simple. Now let's talk about application load balancers. Application load balancers don't work at layer four. They don't look at just the TCP UDP protocol port number. Application load balancers are smart. So they work at layer seven of the OSI model. They are looking at things like the things that are in the path, elements in the header, whether you use like an HTTP push or a get, they can route on source address. So this stuff's amazing for load balancing HTTP or HTTPS traffic, uh, realistically speaking. And uh, no, Ken, yesterday we said we you, the smallest subnet you could use was a slash 28, but we also said not to use it. Um, the smallest subnet that AWS will allow was a slash 28, but we said use slash 30 for web links and slash 24s are the smallest. Keep that in mind. But yes, you could do a slash 28, but we don't recommend you do so. You'll find yourself in all kinds of problems. So application load balancers, think of it this way. Real, real smart. And, you know, they work a little different if we look through. We've got the load balancer. They're listening. And you can see they're running health checks like everything else. And what's kind of going on here. So health checks, rules, just like anything else. Now, when we're going to talk about application load balancers, things are going to get a little different when we start talking about sticky sessions. It's not native with the application load balancers. We can still use the sticky sessions, meaning that we can go, we can maintain the server things, but we're going to have to do it differently. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a minute. And that's going to be done with session cookies. But let's at least just address the classic load balancer for a minute. It's an old version of load balancers. They're the legacy platform, which you can use with both EC2 Classic and the newer VPC. They auto scale like anything else. And just like anything else, you've got an application lower. They can also terminate SSL connections. They can also provide logs and they can also give you good logs in CloudTrail. Just, just keep in mind, classic version of the same thing. Now, when I talk about load balancers, for people like me that have been involved forever, we're familiar with internal load balancers and external load balancers, but many people are not. So I wanna make this clear. External load balancers are internet facing. And they're often called internet facing load balancers. When would you use an external load balancer to load balance 50 web servers? When would you use an internal load balancer to load balance 50 internal servers, maybe 50 HR servers, 50 electronic health record servers, 50 whatever servers. So load balancers can be facing the internet called internet facing load balancers or external load balancers, or they could be internal load balancers. The point of the load balancer is just to load balance. Now, when we're talking about load balancers, we've got some terminology that we have to talk about. I hate using terminology. I hate industry jargon, but we actually have to understand this. With the load balancers, we're typically talking about a couple of concepts. The first concept is the listener. A listener is gonna be a process on the load balancer that's gonna look for connection requests. And an application load balancer is typically used for HTTP or HTTP request, S request. A network load balancer obviously is gonna look at the TCP or the UDP, and they're still gonna look for the port one to 65535. So the listener is where it's gonna look at it. Are you, what are they listening for? Are you listening to just something layer four? Or are you listening, looking at something layer seven? Now, the next concept is the target. And the target is where the load balancer sends the traffic. And it can be a system or an IP address. Now, when the target is an IP address, it needs to come from one of these two places. The RFC 1918 private address space, which is the 10.0.0 slash 8, the 172.16 slash 12, the 192.168.0.0 slash 16, or it could also be coming from the 100.64.0.0 slash 10, but that's specified in RFC uh, 6598, the shared address space. And the next concept that we want to talk about are something called target groups. So target groups enable you to group your targets together. 
Now, I talked about when we're dealing with sticky sessions on load balancers. When we're dealing with load balancers, network load balancers are automatically sticky, meaning they maintain the session state between the load balancer and the server because of the way they work, the flow, just looking at the header. Now, when we're dealing with application load balancers, their flow is different. So by default, an application load balancer is going to load balance each request to the lowest load. So because of that, you might want to manually keep systems on the same server. So if you do that with the AWS, what you're typically working with is you're dealing with a cookie that can be placed. And by using a cookie, the application load balancer can do that. And we talked a little bit about health checks and the health checks of what they're actually doing is going on to the concept. So the next kind of concept I want to talk about, and I'm actually going to whiteboard this one out for you, are load balancer sandwiches and load balancer technologies. So let me put a blank slide over here that we can do so I can, I, I want to whiteboard this out for you. So let's talk about some load balancer situation. So when we're dealing with load balancers, we're going to be dealing with several environments. Network load balancers fast. Application load balancers slow. Can we benefit from these things? Yes, we can. So let's walk through. Now, also, I also want you to remember this. I love AWS and I love their services, but their load balancers may not be enough for your customer. Your customer may demand more. Your customer may demand more features, more functionality than is possible with the AWS load balancer. So know that a lot of your customers are gonna need more. Now the AWS elastic load balancers are excellent, but sometimes you need more. And when you need more, you need to do it. So let's walk through the concept of the elastic load balancer sandwich and some nice fancy load balancer concepts. Let's look at this one option. And AWS finally allows you to do this. We've been doing this in the data center forever. AWS allows you to do it starting two weeks ago. So we're pretty excited by this. Every time we see one of these new features and functions, the cloud becomes closer and closer and closer to the data center. And when we can have cloud agility and data center-like performance, that is when the cloud is the best thing that ever happened to us. And guess what? We're getting pretty close to this and we're getting there by the, each day we get a lot, a lot, a lot better. So. You know, these are the kind of things that we're realistically talking about. So let's go map it out. Application load balancers, for example, really smart. Network load balancers, really fast. So let's look at this. This is a very common situation to use. I've got a network load balancer for its speed, which would then go to a couple with load balance a couple of application load balancers, which would each then load balance a bunch of web servers. This is a very common um, data center type architecture. And now as of about two weeks ago with AWS, we can do the same thing in AWS that we've done in the data center for a couple of decades. And this is really exciting because this is a very, very, very common environment. So this would be you know, using load balancers to load balance other load balancers. And why would we do this? We get the speed. So like, if you're gonna load balance between regions, you might use a network load balancer, not an application load balancer. You're gonna use a network load because it's fast. Or maybe it's inside of a region. What if these servers have 128 cores in them or something like that? What if we've got a thousand servers with 128 cores that are just our front end web server? We might actually need 50 application load balancers and a bunch of network load balancers to load past them. So there's that. Now, the next thing, which is typically speaking, where the, the foundations of an elastic load balancer sandwich, and we're not going to build the whole sandwich, is but I want you to understand. Now, let's say, for example, we needed some really robust features for our load balancers, and we need features and functionality. So let's walk it through. If I need greater features and functionality than I can get on an elastic load balancer, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to the AWS marketplace. I go to the AWS marketplace and I go to the marketplace and I say, I need the best load balancer. Okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? I'm going to pick something maybe from F5. What is F5 made for the last 20 years? 
load balancers and DNS. So I'm going to get a load balancer, EC load balancer, which is going to run on an EC2 instance. Now, if anybody can see the problem with a load balancer on an EC2 instance, EC2 instances are not high availability. So if I had this F5 on an EC2 instance, if this F5 EC2 instance was my main load balancer and it died, we've got a problem. So what people actually do in the cloud when they need much greater features and functionality, what they do is they create a sandwich. And what they do is they use the AWS load balancer, because this is fast, and the AWS load balancers are, are virtual devices. They're logical. They're high availability. And we can use an AWS load balancer to load balance multiple load balancers, virtualized appliances that are sitting on EC2 instances, and they could be load balancing the servers behind it. <clears throat> so this is the kind of application and load balancer design that you as the cloud architect are really going to do. You're going to be dealing with a lot of this stuff. Now, what if you had some firewalls that you were getting from the AWS environment? Maybe you needed a high security environment, something that's much more substantial than Waffen Shield. Because if you're dealing with high security, you're going to need a robust firewall. So maybe we wanted something from Cisco or Palo Alto. We want a good enterprise-grade firewall. Where are we going to put the enterprise-grade firewalls? We're going to stick them on an EC2 instance. So again, we don't have high availability. It's not like in the cloud. We can walk up to the rack, screw in a bunch of firewalls, cable them up, and let them do their own auto scale, their own heartbeats between them and their own high availability clustering. We can't do that. So we've got to do something. So we can use a network load balancer to load balance Palo Alto firewalls. Now, recently, AWS came up with a new flavor. They call it a gateway load balancer. And then we're using the gateway load balancer to do the same thing that the network load balancer chose to do. And a gateway load balancer is a way to load balance gateways. So gateway load balancer, network load balancer, use whatever version of the same thing you want to use. I'm not big on names. I'm big on functionality. Use your gateway load balancer. Use your network load balancer to load balance your load balancers. So these are the kind of things that we're talking about with regards to load balancers and advanced load balancer tactics. It's really about making sure that we use the load balancers for what they need to be used for. So these load balancers can get fairly complicated. So let's do this. Let's give you guys a chance to ask some questions on load balancers. Are there any questions for load balancers? I'm pretty sure, Jeannie, that they only, you, you, you use the uh, network load balancers exclusively for multi-AZs. Um, even if you could use an application load balancer, you wouldn't, because if you're going to go to two different data centers, Jeannie, you need the speed and the performance, and you're not going to get speed and performance out of an application load balancer. So I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend using a network load balancer for these things. Application load balancers, load balance between microservices, load balance between you know small servers load balance between containers small stuff network load balancers load balance between data centers so i don't even don't even kind of think about it hi mike how i'm let me try and read this So in normal networking, Shakir, load balancers are physical devices. They are specialty machines. They've got ASICs and FPGAs in them that basically route traffic really, really, really fast. Big machines, expensive machines, you stick them in a rack, and they are fast. They are purpose-built, 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 fast, fast, fast. So they are physical devices. In the cloud, these physical devices basically just are virtual devices, but in the data center, they are physical devices. They are typically made by F5. If you want to learn about load balancers, you are not going to get enough information from the AWS website to be sufficient for your career. You can read the AWS documentation and the documentation that's in this, which is the most of the AWS documentation, is in the advanced networking. Some of it's in the certified solution architect professional. But if you want a career in cloud or data center and you're going to be working with networking and you're going to be working with load balancers, 
realistically speaking, you're going to need a lot more than what's just in these courses. You're going to need to go to the F5 documentation page and really get some great education on load balancers because these load balancers are absolutely essential uh, for every component when it comes to performance and availability. So Shakir definitely asked that question. Tech with Mufaz, can load balancers balance other load balancers? Absolutely, Mufaz. We just actually whiteboarded that situation. So Tech with Mufaz, I'm going to yeah, ask you I, I, I think that came in uh, while you were doing that, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so Tech with Mufaz, the question I'm going to ask you is this. If you ask this question, which I'm assuming prior to us doing that live architectural demo, um, let us know that your question has been answered. If you still have some questions there, I'll go over it a second time because if you're curious, then somebody else is curious and I wanna make sure we made it clear as possible for you. So Mufaz, let me know if we answered your question. I know we did, but I wanna make sure that there's no question in your mind because if there's question in your mind, I'm happy to do it again. I wanna know that when we finish and you finish the day that you had a great learning experience, because each day is going to build. So I want to know that you're solid. So please let me know. Chris, are there other questions on this topic? Oh, David Page, can I clarify what a gateway load balancer does again? Yes, absolutely. So let's go, let me go back and go back to this diagram. So in this particular environment, Let's say you've got any kind of thing. Let's say you've got two, two we'll, we'll call it firewalls for right now. So let's say you've got your enterprise and you've got your internet connections. Let's say here's your internet. Now in a perfect world, off the cloud, here's what we would do with our firewalls. Our firewalls, they would have some kind of a, a heartbeat between them, a health check between them, and realistically what will happen, we typically have like an IP address or a virtual IP address that what would happen is the, the all the other devices will point to this address and this is the active thing. And this firewall may be asleep, and this active address will send the traffic out here and everything works and it's perfect. But what we're typically dealing with in this environment, in the cloud, we don't have the ability to, to do these heartbeats between them and create this virtual environment where it's gonna go out this firewall or out this firewall based upon which, which one of these firewalls is active. Because in a normal environment, we'll have this firewall maybe sleeping and everything will be going through here. Everything's gonna work perfectly. but if this firewall were to die, for example, we need all the traffic to go this way. Or if this firewall were to die, we typically speaking need the traffic to go this way. So in a normal environment, we let the firewalls do this and they've got their own kind of redundancy protocols. We can't do that on the cloud because we can't stick an actual physical firewall here. We don't have the opportunity. It's not a real firewall. And because of this, we're not dealing with the regular firewall. How are we going to promote the high availability? If this is an EC2 instance and crashes, and this is an EC2 instance and it crashes, how could we do it? How could we load share it? Could we use more than one firewall? Maybe. We sure could. Or could we create high availability? So now look at it this way. If we took the internet and now we took a load balancer, and the load balancer fire balanced between these two firewalls. If this firewall were to go away, remember what the health the, the, the fire the load balancers do. Are you there? This firewall says, I'm here. So right now the network load balancer, gateway load balancer, doesn't matter. Firewalls, are you there? The firewall on the top says, I'm here. Firewall on the bottom one says, I'm here. Firewall on the top says, I'm here. Firewall on the bottom says, I'm here. Firewall on the top says, I'm here. Firewall on the bottom says, I'm here. Firewall on the top doesn't say anything. Firewall on the bottom says, I'm here. Firewall on the top says nothing.
Firewall on the bottom says I'm here. Firewall on the top says nothing. Firewall on the bottom says something. Firewall on the top says nothing. Firewall on the bottom says nothing. Ding, 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 ding. Sets off an alarm in the load balancer. Health check failed. Health check failed. Health check failed. Remove this firewall. It's dead. And then the load balancer knows to send all the traffic to here. And it goes inside of the organization. This is... Uh, this is exactly what we're kind of talking about. This is how the load balancers actually load balance these things actually properly. So this is what we're talking about with regards to gateway load balancers, network load balancers. Um, we're talking about load balancing. So not only can we load balance for performance and get two load balancers, but we can do it for availability. Now, realistically speaking, we used to use a network load balancer for this. Now there's a gateway load balancer. The gateway load balancer is designed to basically load balance between network devices. When that, so, But whether you're using a network load balancer, which is what we've used in the industry forever, or something that AWS actually calls, realistically speaking, it's no big deal. So I hope I answered your question there. Hold on one second. Okay, so now let's talk about, you know, there's another question and it's really good with regards to how do you scale a website? It's a great question. And by the way, you may see that question on an interview. So let's talk about how to answer Ken's question. So because it's a good, it's a really solid question and I wanna make sure we at least address part of it ahead of time. And it pertains to EC2 instances and scalability. So. Let me answer the next question, which is super easy before we get that. Is SD-WAN basically a load balancer? Not in any way, shape, or form. Um, Software-defined networking is as follows. Typically speaking, when we're dealing with routing, we've got the control plane, which is our protocol, our routing protocol, OSPF, EIGRP, intermediate systems to intermediate systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the things that we're typically talking about. Um, so typically speaking, what these kind of things are, are doing. So what was the question I was, so, at, so typically speaking, the control plane or the routing protocols and the forwarding plane or the data plane is on the same device. The forwarding plane is the router saying, go this way, go this way, go this way, go this way, go this way. That's the, the forwarding plane is the moving the traffic, that hot potato that I showed. But the control plane is determining where your traffic goes. SD-WAN is basically the separation of the control plane or where the traffic goes and the traffic is directed from the data plane where the traffic is actually forwarded. So that's what SDN is. SDN is taking the routing, at least the, the logic of the routing, off of the router and sticking it onto a server and having the routers do what they do, which is forwarding traffic, which is something they do very well. So these are the kind of things that we're trying to talk about. Okay, Caroline. You said, you said that you were going to do Ken Sherman's thing. Um, yeah, you just, uh, I just, oh, you know what? I'm, I, you didn't, you up. didn't, you didn't do it. So yeah, I didn't, see, I didn't see it on the screen. Right. There's three pieces, so that's why. Okay. So Ken Sherman's question, if an application runs on EC2 instances behind a load balancer and the instances are part of an auto scaling group across multiple availability zones, Chris, what's the second half of this? The auto scaling scales up to 20 instances during, but then scales them to two at night. Auto scaling is going to be very slow. Is there a set, is there more to this? What should you do to solve the problem and keep the cost? Okay, so this is an extremely common interview question as well. When you have an environment where you've set up basically your auto scaling environment, and you know ahead of time that you're gonna have high traffic patterns. You should change your auto scaling policy. You should set up some scheduled auto scaling. Have the policy at the beginning of the day, schedule things to go. Pre-warm your load balancers and tell them ahead of time to do this. So the problem with auto scaling is it's too slow. The benefit of auto scaling 
is that it is, mind you, auto scaling is the main reason organizations go to the cloud. If there was no auto scaling, the cloud would be a low performance version of the data center. But that auto scaling of the cloud is what makes the cloud possible. It makes you buy what you need on the cloud, only what you need, and then scale out. Without auto scaling, the cloud would be low performance and a much more expensive version of what you can do in the data center. But auto scaling is basically the best thing that's ever happened to computing. Because auto scaling enables the organization to buy exactly what they need and add capacity is what they need. That's where the cost savings occur on the cloud. That is the best feature of the cloud, but auto scaling is slow. So when you're dealing with auto scaling, and this is more of a concept for the certified solution architect professional, <clears throat> but you set a policy. There's a minimum number of servers, a maximum number of servers, and a desired number of servers. Set that up ahead of time. Do the same thing with your load balancers. Pre-warm them, get them active, and then you won't have into these problems and you're gonna be in great shape. So that's how you're gonna deal with that, Ken. And I wanted to make sure, now Caroline, Please talk about firewalls in the cloud. Why can't you add one? Okay, Caroline, this is a switch. Go add it to the cloud. And I mean this in the most respectful sort of way. Go add this physical device to the cloud. How are you gonna do it? You can't. So how do you bring something to something that's somewhere else? Now, if I could call AWS on the phone and I could say, AWS, please give me access to your data center allow me to stick my own hardware in it, then I wouldn't have to work around these things. So the point is, is I need something that's good because I can't physically go there. Now, when we're dealing with firewalls on the cloud, we have two options. We can use the kind that the cloud providers give us, like WAF, which are good for generic use cases. But when we need to provide real deep security, Real deep, we need something far, far, far better than firewall as a service. We need a real firewall. So you got to look at it this way. Ta there's times where outsourcing is good and times where it's not. When you need security, which Caroline for you is probably going to be every customer you design, you're not using firewall as a service anything. You're going to have to make the decision. Do you, can you get away with things that are cloud native like WAF and Shield? And for your small clients, you can. It's going to be great. And for your big clients, you're going to need something enterprise-y, something like a Cisco environment or a Palo Alto environment. And you're not, it's not just because you're going to need better firewalls than you can actually get from the cloud providers. You're going to have to deal with some cool routing. So in other words, if I deal with Cisco, for example, and we create our we 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 put a VPN concentrator in there, when your users connect, they're going to get the routing added to BGP automatically. So we need substance here. Firewall as service is not going to be anything close to the substance we need. So think about WAF and Shield for the basics. And for when it really matters, we're going to get an EC2 instance from the marketplace. It's going to have Cisco, Palo Alto, Fortinet, or uh, actually uh, Cisco, Palo Alto, Fortinet. Checkpoint makes some good security products as well. So that is Juniper Networks. There's a few of them that are really solid out there. But your market leaders, for the most part, are Cisco, Checkpoint, and Palo Alto. They are the firewalls you're going to use for your customers that matter. And Caroline, even if there's something that's equivalent, when you go deal with a customer that's already spent, you know, a billion dollars on their network over the last 10 years, and they're getting great results at a Palo Alto firewall, they're not going to leave that secure Palo Alto firewall and say, hey, I'm going to adopt WAF. They're going to want something that's equally good, if not better. So they're going to get the same thing they're already using with the same policies that actually work in the cloud. So I hope I answered that question. That is the reason why. That is the reason why. So that's exactly why we're using things like the Cisco Adaptive Security Appliance. It's software that gets put on an EC2 instance inside of the cloud. And that's why we're load balancing these things to create redundancy amongst these things. That is the reason. Yes, if you don't need your 20 instances first thing, you can schedule a policy, tell you when you do need it. But you're going to have to pre-warm it and you're going to have to load balance ahead of time, Ken. 
If you don't do it ahead of time, here's what's going to happen. You're going to lose orders. And if an organization loses orders, it's going to cost more. So Ken Sherman, the thing, and this is why the architect is not an engineer. This is why the architect is a business executive. This is why tech is nowhere close to enough to become an architect. You need to be a business executive. So what you have to do as, as follows is figure this out. You have to quantify as the architect. What is the expected orders going on during the day? And if the orders equal $30 million, and if they're going to lose $10 million of orders by not having their server scaled out ahead of time, it doesn't matter if it costs an extra $20,000 a day to have your server scale out ahead of time. So you need to quantify the problem. When you quantify the problem ahead of time, ahead of time, then you know what you're working with in regards to when to sell, to scale these things out. So you need to, need to, need to plan it ahead of time. What is the business case? You may need to start all 20 instances three hours before you can need it. Because if the orders come in two hours too early and you didn't do it, it could cost you so much money that the little bit of cost from running the extra servers is nothing by comparison to the lost earnings. So you're going to have to basically schedule it out based upon knowledge, knowledge of the business. That is the business piece. And you need to plan it out ahead of time. And you might need to get smarter. Maybe you're using an SQSQ as part of your three-tier website. Maybe you look at the depth of messages in the queue and not the CPU, and then you scale it out. CPU may not be the right metric to look at. It could be memory if your application's memory intensive. It could be the depth of messages in an SQSQ. You as the architect need to look at the business, not the tech, the business. And you need to figure out the business impact of loss. What is the loss of not having the capacity? And then you determine the capacity ahead of time. But you can't determine the capacity. You can't determine what you're going to sell. You can't determine what you should do in any way, shape, or form or in any capacity until you've quantified that business problem. So the, it's the tail wagging the dog instead of the dog wagging the tail. Don't start with how do I do the tech? Why are you doing the tech? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Is it database congestion? How do you deal with that? Is it database write? Is it database read? Is it IOPS on the web server that the page can't handle it faster? These are the problems that you need to know long before we can say, hey, just scale out based on CPU. CPU may be the wrong metric. So I kind of wanted to make sure that we can determine these things. This, well, solo firewalls generally face the internet. But firewalls could also face extranet partners. Firewalls could also keep you from, uh, from protecting different regions of your environment from other users. So there's firewalls everywhere. Like I've got one firewall in my home that protects me from the internet. I've got another firewall set up between my lab and uh, my main, and because sometimes I run some security appliances and some Kelly Linuxes and things. These are kind of those questions. So could a load balancer perform a health check? Um, load balancers perform health checks. Chris, you want to go to the next one? They asked if a network load balancer can do it like an application load balancer. Well, they all work differently, but all load balancers use health checks. Okay. They, they were just asking if they could do it like each other. So yeah, They all do health checks. Right. James Wallington. Are there tools that help quantify the sorts of business problems? Yes. Your brain. So James Wellington, this is why an engineer and an architect must require different training. This is why if you train like an engineer, you can't work as an architect. And if you train like an architect like me, you typically don't have the engineering skill because they are very different careers. So James Wellington, that's why we train business acumen in our cloud architect program. If you train with us, you are great on a business acumen. If you do not train with us and you want to be an architect, make sure you get business acumen training. Business acumen training includes ROI modeling training. Business acumen training includes expected value of an opportunity training. Business acumen training includes presentation skills training. Business acumen training requires CXO relevancy problem. To get to this information, James, you're going to have to be at the CEO. You're going to have to figure out what their goals are. You need to know all this. And you're not going to get that without speaking to the CEO, the CIO, the CTO, and the CFO. you got to get all these people. 
then you're going to need to speak to their operations people and figure out like their COO and figure out what, what operational challenges they have. These are the things you quantify the problems. For example, if I was going to a hospital, first thing that I would do is I'd speak to the hospital CEO and I'd say, what's your greatest cost? And he would say, or she would say, nurses. And I would say, how much overtime do your nurses work? And they'd say about $37 million per year. And I'd say, how many hours is that? And he'd say an average of one hour per nurse per year. And I'd say, okay, what if I can keep your nurses from working overtime? And they'd say, yes, Mike, we spend $37 million on overtime. You have up to $37 million of tech to spend. So the answer is you do the quantification. This is why for the architect, you must develop executive presence because if you don't have the executive presence, you can't speak to the CEO. This is why you must become CXO relevant, which is like why when I spent at Cisco, they sent us constant training to make sure that we were relevant for the CEO, CFO, CTO, because you gotta be able to ask the right questions to get this kind of information. Then once you get this information, you need to act on this information. So again, you need to know enough about business. Then you need to know enough about these network and data center technologies and the workflow and the use cases of these technologies. Then you need to evaluate business processes and how people do things. Because James, the technology design is gonna affect the process. For example, the best example I can give you is healthcare. Prior to healthcare, we used to use these paper records. They were sloppy, you couldn't read handwriting. When we used paper records, medical errors were the fifth leading cause of death in the US. Fifth leading cause of death, errors. And then we were digitizing healthcare. And I consulted the hospitals all across the world and they said, Mike, should I buy this? And I said, don't buy this yet. I said, if you buy this, the, the application is going to change the workflow of your doctors and nurses. And the way it's going to change the workflow of your doctors and nurses is going to cause danger. And it's going to cause injuries, illnesses, and death. And I said this very clearly to a lot of hospitals because I knew the workflow designed by the new electronic health records was dangerous. So you know what? The government a year later mandated electronic health records. And they told providers that if you don't do this, it's going to cost you 2%, but here's money. Go buy it for free. Do you know what happened? Healthcare organizations bought these new applications. Doctors went from spending 15 minutes with the patient or 12 minutes of their 15 minutes seeing the patient, three minutes actually documenting, to, th to 12 minutes working on the computer and three minutes evaluating the patients. Medical errors in the U.S. went from the fifth leading cause of death with sloppy paper to the third leading cause of death with technology. More deaths from going from sloppy handwriting to tech. The tech that had decision support, they would help you when you'd made an error because it impacted the workflow. So the architect must be the expert at the workflow. So these are the reasons. These are the reasons these architect training is so different than engineering training. This is why if you ask me a question that's deep in engineering, I'm happy to say, I don't know. Because I'm an architect and I focus on business transformation. That's what architects do. So that's why I want to help you guys get hired. So tomorrow at 9 a.m., we will talk about how to get your first cloud architect job. And I will tell you exactly where you can learn all of these things, either with us or on your own to get hired. But this is why people don't get cloud architect or solution architect jobs, because they study again and again and again, Python scripting, which we architects do. They study DevOps, which we architects don't do. They study SysOps, which we architects do, and they study everything other than what we architects do. And I want you all to get cloud hired. So please register the link in the description below for tomorrow's how to get your first cloud architect job webinar. I will show all of you how to get hired for whatever career you want. It's a matter of getting hired is as follows. It's matching your skills with the desire of employees, knowing exactly what the employee wants and being there. It's a matter of showing how your value to the organization is much greater than the organization's cost. It's about showing the organization that they can't live without you. And it's about showing how you are the solution to the problem. This is why I don't like to get, I, I tell people if they wanna get hired, don't become 10X certified. I tell them to become an expert on an area and really, really, really make a difference in the customers. So I think we'll end on that, James. Uh, we'll end on that, Chiller Made Media. I'm real excited tomorrow. We've got a 
big day planned for you. Huge day. I will start the day well, at 9 o'clock and we'll get you guys hired. We'll tell you everything you need to go from 9 to 11 to get you hired. Then from 12 to 3, we will do more live training. Then tomorrow night, Imran Takur, who has two CCIEs and he's working on a third CCIE to just prove to his son that it's easy to do at any age. Who's also an aviatrics multi-cloud network engineer who's got every certification as an expert on SD-WAN and everywhere in between. And he's gonna walk you through all this AWS VPC stuff. And we are gonna have a we are gonna have geek it out and we are gonna have a cloud engineering party tomorrow night. We'll have a cloud architect party in the afternoon. I'm an architect. My friend Imram has been both an architect and an engineer, and he's a really, really strong engineer. I see my good friend Alonzo Coleman. I call him James Bond because when you look at him and bring him up, he reminds me of James Bond with the cool dude sunglasses and the uh, really fancy dinner jacket there. So super excited to see you. Can't wait to see you all tomorrow. Honestly, I love being out there, being able to communicate with you and talk to you. It's really wonderful. I love this community. Thank you all for participating. I will see you all tomorrow. Please register for that, how to get your first cloud architect job on tomorrow in the morning. It's going to be a really fun experience and have a wonderful, 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 wonderful day, everyone. Let's get you guys cloud hired. Let's finish it up with a hashtag cloud hired. Let's get you all hired, everybody. And thank you all so much for your nice, kind words. We love you. I know I do everything I can. I know Chris from my team does everything he can. And we are super thankful to have you all with us today. Take care, everyone.